Hello, Motor Rider World fans, and welcome to this episode of Talking Motor GP with myself, Rob Portman. And once again, I'm joined by my colleague, Paul Scott. Paul, uh, hello and welcome. We missed you last week. We had a, a slightly shorter, um, bald version um, joining me last week, uh, which was Shez Marais. Great to, to get his insight, but always glad to have you back, Paul. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, that was a fantastic show and some proper insight from Shez. Obviously, having been there, he was kind of in the mix of things. Um, but yeah, great show you guys put on. And welcome to everyone who's tuning in tonight. And I think we've got some interesting things to debate tonight. Eh? Lots, lots to go through tonight. So, Yvonne Pretorius, Deep Sea Diver Schmidt, um, Mark van Jarsveld, Daryl Holmes, Wayne Taylor, uh, Warwick Evans, Brandon Willemser, Nicole Briett, Luca Jefferson. Yeah, shout out to our World Endurance Riders this weekend. Of course, we've got Sheridan Marias, uh, Stephen Urendahl racing this weekend at um, at Le Mans, I think it is. Yeah, yeah Le Mans 24. So yeah, big shout out to them. JP Swierk, Jacques Clausens is joining us. Uh, Peter Garmany, uh, Jeanade Smith, Ross Smith. Everyone's joining us in because... We, as you said, we've got a lot to talk about. Um, so as you can see, I'm in a, a nice hotel room here in Milton Keynes. I'm still geographically challenged when it comes to the UK, wherever the GPS, I put the postcode in the GPS and it takes me there. But um, close to Silverstone Racetrack and uh, had a really, check out the Motor Rider World Facebook page soon after this. I'll post some pictures and I've already posted a, a little a teaser video of, of what I saw today at the Team Classic Suzuki HQ uh, where Schwantz original GP500 machine, Kenny Roberts Jr. championship winning 500 machines. Just, it was like, you know, the perks of living in the UK when you got these kind of things almost on your doorstep and, and the people you know. So, yeah, keep a look out for that. It's, it, it really is something special. Um, you just tell me they fired one of those two strokes up for you. No, they didn't because they were in like the workshop and that, but I have been at a track day um so, so i've come quite close to these guys and, and and they're very close with aj fenter aj's a big conversation piece with these guys because it's the same guys that brought danny webb over to race there and michael dunlop in the past so um i'm very lucky that i've heard them fire it up before but there's a couple of track days and things later on this year that i'll hopefully be involved with them and there will be some videos of those being fired up. I'll, awesome. I'll make sure I get one to you, Paul. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's say Mike Teal. Good evening, Rob. Greeting from myself and grandson Liam Townsend. What an eventful weekend for our guys. Speed Angle essays in uh, Charmaine Fulhoun. So everyone's joining in, Paul. Um, I think the best place to start is we'll kind of work our way down from 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 the leaderboard, but. The big talking point of the weekend was Maverick Vinales. We, you know, the whole motorcycle world, motorcycle media, fans, everyone alike, it was very transparent what Maverick Vinales was. The supreme talent, one of the fastest motorcycle racers probably on the planet. He never just put it together consistently, wasn't really right here. There was something always missing. He seems to have found something because the entire motorcycle racing world you had to dip your cap to to maverick vinales this weekend because it was a performance of a rider that if if that if that rider comes out more often than not it's he's going to be unstoppable maverick vinales did everything right this weekend from his prestige briefs from the way he talked about his team you know okay second race and, and that was the true test for me was the main sunday races maverick the sprint race, he got the good start pole position. So I was kind of expecting that when he got bumped in turn one and then in the main race, I was kind of thinking, this is where Maverick battles. You know, he doesn't seem to always handle that pressure of fighting through. Or, you know, that's when he gets flustered and he can't seem to gather himself from being flustered. He did everything right this weekend. And now, after a couple of good races, you know, Qatar didn't really feature, but was okay. Portimayo was right there, had that incident. Surely we've got to be talking about Maverick as a title contender, or are we still getting ahead of ourselves? Does Maverick still have to prove a bit more? And Aprilia. Yeah, Rob, you know, I'm certainly eating a lot of humble pie thanks mm -hmm. to Maverick, because, and I'm going to call him back, Mav. As yeah. much as it makes me cringe, he absolutely was dynamic, you know, and I've been a very harsh critic in the past saying, 
and rightfully so. When he's on it, you can't beat this guy. But that happens once every, what was the gap between his last one and this one? Three and a half years. Mm. However, what you're saying this weekend, he certainly put all of that to bed because he wasn't just good Friday morning. It was Friday morning, Friday afternoon, both on Saturday, the sprint race, and then exactly what you said, and the commentators highlighted it on the on the footage. Maverick normally, when he has a poor start, pole position to 11th, gets T-boned a couple of times in the first four or five corners. Normally, that's the end of him. Then he works his way steadily back with Jack. However, this weekend, we saw a Maverick Vinales. I don't think we've ever seen a Maverick Vinales like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to say that next week in Spain, week after this weekend, we're going to see, because everybody, and a lot more guys are more competitive there. I'm not going to say it was an Aprilia thing, even though Aleish wasn't too far behind him in terms of position and place, but he was still way behind. So if this is a turnaround for Maverick and his head is in the right place, which it seems, the bike is certainly capable. Yeah, he's certainly going to be a contender. My next question would be, last week you and Shays discussed it. 4 million euros versus 12 million euros, Fabio Quattararo. What did he think after this weekend where he was no good once again, thanks to his machinery, where the Aprilia was absolutely done. I mean, that bike just looked fantastic everywhere, every session. It's a very, very strong ride. And, you know, if that's the way it's going, Mavs definitely, he is definitely going to be a contender. Look, there are lots of other strong riders in the championship, but nobody has dominated a weekend yet like he did. Mm -hmm. No, that was, uh, it is, everyone commenting pretty much the same sentiments in the comments here that there seems to be this different Maverick this year. You know, we, we've heard about Simon Crafer and the commentators talking about how he's lost weight and there's definitely this more focus in him. Uh, Aprilia, you know, kudos to Aprilia. They took him on when he was at his lowest. He'd just been dumped by Yamaha. He had tried to break the Yamaha. It was, you know, we were all kind of questioning, you know, yeah, why are you taking on this fragile Maverick? And and they've stuck by him. They've they've cuddled him. They've nurtured him in many ways. They've given him this family environment that he's needed to to go out and perform. And he and he's paying them back now. A bit later than 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 I think it should have happened. I thought Maverick, you know, should have been doing better these kind of performances earlier on. But you know, he's taken this time. And I, just like you were saying, I had to also many of us had to eat humble pie because. And, and this is the thing with Maverick. Like I said, you watch him in FP, in the first practice and you go, okay, yeah, that's Maverick. FP, yeah, okay, that's Maverick. Qualifying, yeah, that's Maverick. Sprint race, yeah, okay, that's Maverick. Main race, oh, you see he's got a bad start. Yes. So, so you always have this doubt with Maverick. And this weekend, even when he spoke on the grid, that, that conversation he had on the grid, on the Sunday race grid, when the, the guy said to him, you know, what tires, what your rate, he's like, put me on a soft. I'll win. Put me on a medium, I'll win. Whatever you put me on, I will win this this race. I'm going to win this race. And you're kind of like, geez, Maverick, that's, you know, I, I love your the, this newfound confidence. I love it. But, geez, that's that, that's big talk. And then when he had that start, I thought, oh, yeah, we go. This is this is the end of Maverick. So, happy. I said it, I remember a couple of years ago when I was in the going to all the MotoGP races, I saw Maverick at Silverstone, I think, on the Aprilia, where he really performed. But he came out of his motorhome. He was smiling. His press debriefs were smiling. He was this happy-go-lucky character. And I said then, you know, a happy Maverick is a fast Maverick. You've, they've, himself and Aprilia have got to just somehow keep that Maverick. You know, Maverick is that kind of person that his race weekend is all determined almost in many ways by the first lap of the first session on Friday. Because if he goes out and goes, oh, this bike's feeling terrible, he doesn't seem to be able to recover from that. So if he sorted that out, and he, as you said, he put together the complete weekend this weekend, if he can sort that out, I mean, with the inconsistency and the Ducatis fighting each other and, you know, the Mark and Peko colliding and the Martin, you know, we'll talk about Martin just now, but there's definitely this mental shift with Martin. It, this Maverick is kind of just going under the radar that no one expected, and he's just going to almost pull the rug under uh, Ducati and Peko and everyone, and we're going to have the champion at the end of the year, and we're going to go, Gee, what actually just happened? Rob, I agree with you fully there. A couple of things that I've thought about. First of all, we've discussed it in the past. Have Aprilia kind of given him the number one role? 
and he's taken it on and they're kind of putting Aleish on the, I don't want to say on the back burner, but definitely now there's talk all over the media from Aleish himself saying, oh, he's wondering if he should retire at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. So has something changed fundamentally within Aprilia where they've kind of said to Aleish, and remember last year, Aleish was their glory boy. You mm-hmm. hardly ever saw Maverick. This year, it seemed, the role seems to be reversed. So that seems to be, to me, something where maybe Aprilia have kind of said to him, okay, you are our guy. Aleish, we don't know if he's going to continue. Or maybe they've said to Aleish, you better up your game. And now he's saying, well, maybe it's time to throw in the towel if you're going to treat Maverick as number one and not me. So that's something I think is playing in the Aprilia scenario at the moment, where suddenly they've got a little bit of discontent or disconnect between the two of them and the roles seem to have been reversed my next question would be and we've seen it from Mav or the year that he wrote for Suzuki when it came to contract time because remember he initially was on a one-year deal he was fantastic and then suddenly the contract got renewed and we didn't hear from him again now that's something I've been thinking about remember he doesn't have a contract for next year so are they busy with the negotiations and he realizes right now he's got the next three races to perform because then he'll get the contract he's looking for. Just throwing it out there. I'm not saying that's a yeah. thing at all. But those two things are things that I've taken note are changes. So yeah. whether that's true or not, I must be quite honest, he's a supreme talent. And yes. you don't want to see a guy like him hovering midfield, just like we don't want to see Zarko, uh, Nakagami, where they are at the moment. So it's good for the for the sport. It's good for the interest. It's good for everything. So I'm delighted. I'm just throwing out a couple of things that I think mm. we need to factor into the equation. Um, but certainly, you know, whatever it is, he's taken it on board. He's running with it. And if he does the same thing next weekend in Heret, well, it's going to be an unbelievable championship. Because what we're doing now is where we thought we had three or four, we're throwing in a almost like you say, a guy who's been floating under the radar, and suddenly we've got five guys in the mix. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, well, this is the thing. You know, the first podcast of the year we spoke about, we kind of identified Pico, Martin, Brad, and Mark in a way is like it's kind of between them now. Is Vignales, Bastianini, Pedro Acosta, and Andrew Adams. Just calm down. Maybe you should be talking about Pedro, but you won't because it shows up bad, typical media crap. Andrew, if you're going to join us, love to have you. Love to have your opinion. Just calm it down, please. Just calm it down. And we don't need that kind of attitude on a Tuesday. We are going to pull it apart as we have done. We're going to talk Pedro, Brad, KTM, everything. To finish on the Maverick conversation, I think everyone's kind of done the side here. Brilliant, fantastic, but Maverick needs to do this four, five, six races, you know, are we going to be having the same conversation, you know, midway through the season? That's going to be the final kind of indication of has this Maverick changed or, you know, like I said, next week, two weeks time at Jerez, Friday, first session doesn't go well. And then all of a sudden, all these problems are back up. So, but it it was great to see that Maverick out again, that Aprilia um, confidence, that Aprilia um, competitiveness. So all things pointing in the right direction. Fantastic. Great to see Alicia Spargo cuddling his teammate. Real great vibe there. Brilliant, brilliant job there. Let's talk. That was the highlight of the weekend for me, no doubt. One of one of many, which we'll pick apart. Let's go straight in so we can entertain the Andrew Adams and everyone. Um, let's go straight into for me, what was one of the probably the the the, the worst, other than Honda, because that's just you know dead and buried. Um, KTM, factory KTM team, Brad Binder, Jack Miller. Big talking point um, because Portimao, uh, and we heard from Shez as well, they seemed to do okay in the prior day practice and then just fizzled out. They couldn't make these steps the rest of the teams were. Kind of saw a similar type theme play out at, at Kota. Okay, kind of start and then just, you know, they just hit a brick wall while everyone improves. Um, it came out afterwards that Brad had this motocross crash and a broken finger or a broken bone in his foot. Or Anyway, it was a, it was a battered up Brad. Um, which which you have to take into consideration uh, for any rider. Um, I think the fact that Brad didn't kind of put anything out in the media before or anything was maybe not to, you know, Brad's not that kind of person. He doesn't put anything out, but he was obviously suffering. But having said that, um, you know, Brad didn't have wings for the main race, had some wings taken off, and the bike was very heavy and became unrideable, you know, especially at Kota over the bumps, blah, 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 blah. 
they were, I didn't like the theme of the same as Portimao of factory team just couldn't sort themselves out. They couldn't find a solution. This Jack Miller, and I'm a huge Jack Miller fan again, and I know, Paul, you you can pick it apart more open-mindedly as, as, as more of a, a, an open-minded kind of pundit. This Jack going out on a soft rear tire, being competitive for six laps and then fading back and going, I don't know why, has got to end for me, first of all, because you're not doing yourself, KTM, anyone, any kind of favors. And the, the Brad one was also a bit of a head scratcher for me because apart from the injuries, which I think is probably the biggest attribute to it, but he just never looked good on that bike. Even on the Friday when things were going okay, he just did not look good on that bike. Um, they just never seemed to find a direction. And it, kind of with Portimao as well, they just never found answers to these questions. Whereas Pedro Acosta, who we'll talk after this, seems to be finding those problems. Now, my question to you and probably everyone out there, is it is it more of Brad and Jack's mentality of, well, the KTM can't do this. You can't follow because the front tire will overheat. Uh, the KTM struggles at lean angle. Is it because they've got that in their mind and Pedro's just going, well, I'm going to try it. And he gets away with it. Or is it just, and this is the reality that all South African fans and we all have to deal with, is just, you know, the supremeness of, of Pedro Acosta. I, I suppose my main question here is why have we seen two race weekends in a row where KTM, factory KTM, just can't sort their problems out? Okay, that's, that, that's the how long is a piece of string kind of question. First, I'm going to go back, for those of you who did watch Chase last week on the show, the point where the Brad is, well, we know Brad's injured. What the injury is, he hasn't said anything. Remember what Chase said, South Africans, Brad Binder, in this field, we're too humble. We're too nice. Mm. Had it been, a, and I'll say Pedro Acosta, I don't know if he would have done it, or a Mark Marquez, or a, they would have said, listen, I had a massive crash last week. I'm injured, so take what we can get. If we can get a 8th, ninth, 10th, we'll be happy with that. Brad, it was kept very much under the radar. So just going to what Shea said, you know, it's all intertwined. So I, I don't know if that played a part in it. Um, going back now to what you and I said, in, and I think I remember saying it, beginning of the year when um, uh, Acosta went, was signed with Gas Gas KTM. We said, we put in a guy on a bike who has no expectations. And I think he's proving that point. Mm. He's not getting to a racetrack and being told or having a preconceived idea of his result from last year, how the bike should be ridden, what it can and can't do. I'm certainly of the opinion. He gets on that bike. Obviously, they set it up to how he likes it. And he just rides it as hard as he can ride it. And if that happens to be faster than the factory KTMs and his teammate, well, so be it. And if it's not, he'll learn how to go as fast as them. But right now, he doesn't need that. He's a step ahead of them, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Whether his bike setup is so left field or right field compared to theirs, mm -hmm. I can't see that happening, Rob. I really can't. I could understand after Portimao, they would have looked at the data and said, okay, maybe we must try X, maybe we must try Y. But if you read what Miller said, he said from Sunday morning to Sunday afternoon, they made a small change and it was ridiculous how backwards they went. Come on, guys, you should know at that level a little bit more which direction you need to go. Mm -hmm. So I think they, once again, they're going back to middle of last year where they really didn't know which direction to go, but they had Brad performing. So we also know that Portimao, Cota are not two of his favorite tracks. Can't make excuses like that, unfortunately, but it, uh, it, it it's a reality. So hopefully this coming race at in Spain, things are a little bit better. But right now, I think the factory KTM team are up in arms. Um, and exactly what you say with Miller, he cannot do this four, five, six lap wonder. Yes, he gets fantastic TV time and everyone talks about him. And then for the second half of the race, as I've said for many times, he steadily works his way out of anything decent. You know, that's not helping the collective of the team. Well, you take a guy like Bastianini, who was struggling in sixth, then fifth, then fourth, then third, you know, he's a guy who's working his way forward from, I'm going to say, a mediocre look. That start was hectic for almost everybody. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but he didn't, you know, he moved forward as opposed to backwards. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. I think KTM, they're betwixt and between right now. 
Jack, I think, is a done deal that he's going to move on. But what are they going to do with him? He can't become a test rider because their test rider racing next weekend is going to smoke him. Mm -hmm. So what does he do? What you and Ches were talking about, and now this is just some in way off center that I want to mention. I think he should go be Honda's test rider. Mm -hmm. They need a rider like it's better than Bradle. You guys discussed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've yeah. discussed it ad nauseum. But yeah, what he's doing on the racetrack for KTM right now, I don't believe it's helping them in any way. So what, what they're going to do, which way they're going to go, yeah, it's a very difficult one for them at the moment. So obviously, there's a big discussion going in the comments here. You know, Stephen Berry is climbing in, Andrew Adams. It's, it's kind of, you know, we're not give you, Andrew, please. This is not a, you know, you're shit, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm right. It's not, it's an open discussion, but and and there's no one's denying that the talent of Pedro. But I think what I saw this weekend was everyone jump on and say, that's it, Brad's done, he's finished. Um, you know, a couple of people said the KTM package would be a lot further without Brad. And again, fanboy cap off, honesty cap on. A lot of that stuff that people say is right. The record books speak for themselves. But people forget that Brad has got some great things in that record book. Won his first MotoGP race after three races. Okay, Pedro hasn't done that. Yes, you can pull that apart whichever way you want. That is the fact. Pedro has done fantastic. Yes, and we're going to talk about Pedro after this. Let's talk about the Brad. Two race meetings ago, start of the year. Two second places, pushing the Ducatis all the way to the end. You know, at a track that they never really performed at a couple of years before that. You know, that, that is Brad's contribution to this, this, this package and this exercise. Every rider goes through these bad weekends. Every single rider goes through these bad weekends. Peko Banyaya, the champion, had a bad weekend, made the best out of it, got fifth. For whatever reason, Brad's injuries, they couldn't get the bike set up, KTM's failings, getting it wrong with bike set up and not letting him out at the right time, whatever. whatever. You can pull excuses out the bag all day. The positives of Brad weekend, he got points. He scored points in the main race. Okay, Sprint race, not so well, but main race, qualified 17th, finished ninth. Yes, people crashed in front of him, and forget it, he finished ninth. So he got points in a crap weekend, a terrible weekend. And you can see by the photos of Brad in the pits, there was no smile on that man's face. Brad was, Brad suffered physically, mentally, of course, he doesn't like seeing Pedro, although straight off the race, if you look, Brad, up to Pedro, on the track, well done, lad, tip of the cap, brilliant. Okay, so keeping that professionalism. And this is stuff you cannot take away from Brad Brenner. Andrew, whoever wants to talk about Brad being finished, blah, 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 these are facts you cannot take away. So, yes, he's he, he knows. He's sitting there going, How is he, he, he knows the talent that is Pedro. We all do. It's up to Brad and them now to change it. And there's going to be races where Brad destroys Pedro. And there's going to be races where Pedro destroys, destroys Brad. But the positives are Brad took points, made the best out of a shit weekend, great. The negatives, as we spoke about, was they couldn't find a solution. They couldn't beat the non, you know, the gas gas team uh, as the factory team. They couldn't beat Pedro. Pedro made it work. Pedro was the only, by you know, KTM rider that made it work. Jack didn't, Brad didn't, Augusto Fernandez didn't. So Pedro is a special talent, and I said we're going to talk about him now. But this this jumping on the bad wing and saying Brad's finished and blah 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 blah. You speak to Pedro Acosta, one on one, and he'll tell you how much Brad has been a part of. You know, he'll never dismiss Brad. It, no one in that paddock will dismiss Brad. So everyone dismissing Brad is what pisses me off first as a fan and as a journalist, because no one should be writing Brad off. As you said, Oli Moto said, you're going to go to Jerez, a track where Brad's performed before. You know, Brad, if Brad puts four weekends in a row, shit weekends like he's had at, at, at Portimao, I think, fine. Then you can start, you know, cracking open the, oh, you know, what's going on here. For God's sake, the guy was second in the World Championship going into this round. Yes, he's lost it and he slipped down. But that's that's the quality of MotoGP. That's the quality of MotoGP is that every weekend now, just um, – Going into Dakota, did any of us see Maverick Vignola's dominance? No. Yeah. And anyone who tells me yes, you must have a crystal ball hidden somewhere. Okay. So, so this is how we've got to have these open conversations, and and and, and some people just take it a little bit too far. What what I will say is, the more Pedro outperforms the factory KTM team and Brad, the more these discussions will be amplified, and the you know you know, you know what I mean. So. It's up to Brad and, and the KTM team now 
to fix the problem um, and to find the solution and to get back on track the way that they'd started the season and it will come. But that is my only concern with this this whole Pedro Brad. And it doesn't have to be a Pedro Brad thing. It doesn't have to be. They're all wor working to the same main goal, to make KTM better, to make KTM more competitive. And you would be an idiot not to think that Pedro, it's a brilliant thing to see Pedro doing that. Because surely that's going to, to bring the whole KTM project. It's going to lift Jack. I don't know about you know, Jack, I just find in a, in a weird place, but certainly Brad, it's going to, it's going to lift everything. Pedro can take them to that next level. Just like Mark Marquez came into MotoGP, and I said it with Brad last week, last week, Pedro in a way is kind of almost reinventing MotoGP, taking it to that next step where the riders are going to look and say, right, how is this guy, Brad? There were some onboards there watching Pedro Acosta when he was passing Martin and them on the brakes. I'm going, there's no way you're stopping that bike. You know, Marquez says he crashed on the brake because he hit a bump and he had to touch the brakes again. Pedro just never looked out of control. Brad and Jack are riding this bike that's out of control. And, you know, Jonathan Borg made a, made a comment on Facebook as well that, you know, he always said that Brad and them were overriding the KTMs and they looked spectacular, but the KTM was a better package than they were showing to be. And again, initially, I, you get your backup and, oh, Jonathan, F you. And if you break it apart and you go, well, you know, Brad, Brad and Jack were completely out of shape this weekend, sliding into the corners, you know, overloading the front. And there's Pedro making it look so easy. Sheridan was messaging me throughout that day going, how easy does this guy make it look? This is against the best in the world. He's passing Martin on the brakes. He's leading the race with, you know, Martin, Peco, Marquez on his, and he doesn't seem phased. So this is the supreme talent that we're talking about, Pedro. So this is not the, you know, Pedro is a supreme talent. This weekend proved it once again. But it doesn't mean that Brad's not. And, and I think that's you know the long and the short of it. So we've got to we've got to just kind of keep this all, we've got to see the bigger picture. We can't, it's so easy to just go ah, blah, 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 blah. the bigger picture is that the KTM and Pedro's performances are just going to improve everything. And we've already seen it. Pedro is taking the fight to Ducati and to Aprilia, and he's going to bring Brad along for the ride because Brad's already been there and given Pedro that package, that, that proper good base foundation to be able to do what he's doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, I don't see what people are writing in the comments, but a couple of things that you read and I'm going to highlight. Someone mentioned that they don't think the KTM, the KTM would have been further ahead without Brad. I 100% disagree with that. Mm. And we've got a little bit of insight because our mate James Dent spends a lot of time with the binders in the binder ktm pit and he's befriended their team and he gets a lot of inside information and i can tell you without a shadow of a doubt brad binder is ktm's number one rider by 300 million miles he is the guy they look to first yes i understand that certainly pedro's throwing a big spanner in the works but brad without a doubt is the guy they look to so I don't believe for a second without Brad, the bike would be better. Not a chance. One thing I do worry a little bit about, going back to Shazer's comments about Brad being the nice guy, is, is Pedro 1% getting into Brad's head? That's mm. something you can never discredit. And now we're talking as a, as a pundit, as a supporter, as a lover of MotoGP, not the Brad Binder fanboy. Brad Binder as a rider, I've said it many times, as good as anyone there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is Pedro doing in his head? Yeah. I don't know. We mm -hmm. won't know. I think Brad mentally is tough enough to deal with the challenge. Mm -hmm. He's done it in the past. He's had fast arrivals in his as teammates initially. Miguel Oliver being one of them. And at the end of the season, he was blitzing them. Brad can certainly adapt. He just doesn't have too much time to adapt. So he's got to, whatever the problem was this weekend, he needs to sort it out. If it is a mental thing, it's got to be sorted out by next weekend in Spain. Because as you said, Rob, you can't have three or four bad weekends in a row because then it's done and dusted. Um, you can't make up that kind of deficit. So uh, certainly I, I wouldn't be writing him off the comments. Also, there was a big clickbait article saying, mm -hmm. oh, Binder's out of factory KDM, and it's going to be Pedro Acosta and Mark Marquez. 
that's just some oak who could be me posting a story on the internet. Remember, not everything on Facebook is true. Um, so, you know, you know it's, a, it's, it's a very debatable point, mm -hmm. but I don't believe for one second that that's the I can't see KTM reneging on Brad's contract. I cannot see it. As you say, he was second in the championship. He had a cuck weekend. It happens. But he's still there, their number one rider and by a long shot. So I think there's a lot of hype. And obviously, we've discussed it. Are you watching with your heart or are yeah. you watching with your head? You've got to do yeah. both. We're passionate. It's a sport that we love. You get involved. You want your guy to be their guy. But you also sometimes have to take a step back and just say, okay, realistically, this Pedro Acosta is special. So go back to the mid-90s. McDoan changed the style of motorcycle racing then it wasn't called moto gp then along came then there was a bit of a lull but then along came one valentino rossi mm -hmm. moved the goalpost then along came there was no one else after maybe casey stoner i'm not gonna give him too much credit but then mm -hmm. came one mark marquez who once again moved the goalpost and now pedro costa i think is the new generation exactly what you mentioned mm -hmm. you'll see the other guys are going to have to adapt to what he's doing and remember it's his third race Mm -hmm. So I certainly think that's just the timeline I would sell any sport. The next mm -hmm. generation comes along and they don't get, you know, they just fit in. It's not like suddenly where did this guy come from? They fit in. It becomes natural to them and they just take over like Marquez did, like Rossi did, Duan did. Um, yeah, so I think that's what's happening. It's, it's the, I don't want to say the changing of the guard, but also just want to highlight a point that I mentioned to somebody we were having a screaming match on, on Facebook where I said to him, understand what I've mentioned about Davizioso on the Ducati, did mm -hmm. all the hard yards, Pekka Bagnaya and all the current crop are reaping the benefits. Mm -hmm. But it was actually Dovi who did all the work. Yeah. And that's just the timing of the beast. Yes. Now Brad's put in all the hard yards, Pedro walks into a bike that immediately is competitive. Imagine if Pedro had got on a Honda this year. Don't think it would have been the same story. To be quite honest, I think yep. you would have got the same results that Mark was getting on the Honda. So you know, sort of seventh, eighth, ninth. But yeah, you know, that's a debate for a different day. But yeah, that's that's my thought on this whole Brad sentiment, where he's going or not going, and where Pedro Acosta is going to fit into this. I think the next eight to ten years regarding him and no injuries. Yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Paul. And I think, you know, in many ways, Kota was the worst track for Brad for any rider to go, you know, with any kind of injury. Watching those onboards and that and, and, and a lap, it is, it is so physically demanding. I remember going there a couple of years ago with James and walking the circuit. It, it is so physically demanding. So there's a lot to be said about Brad. I like this comment here from Zama Makahomba. I hope I said that right, Zama, and love your comment. Brad is the re reliable type of rider. When things are working well he wins races okay and 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 that's up for debate and this is where you know the naysayers will say no he doesn't and in a way they write because the record books say that he hasn't won a main race in two years or whatever but he's won sprint races races and he's been competitive so when things are working well he's competitive i'll change that too and can take a championship when things aren't good enough he does his absolute best to get the best result possible never moaning kicking or screaming he works with the team all the way some riders will be lucky to find things suiting them and shine but brad makes himself shine uh, just you all watch him take this MotoGP championship seat soon. For now, let him work his way. There's no need for negative. Well said, Zama. That's, you know, in, in a nutshell, that's exactly how we need to. And as a lot of people said, yeah, we, you know, you've got to take in the factors like, um, you know, his injuries. The the aero one is a tricky one for me because, like Shez also mentioned. We've seen in the past where an arrow has been broken off or fallen off. Mark's arrow went off quite early on in the race, and they're still able to go fast. You know, yeah, after the race, they complain about, you know, it's a bit more sluggish and they've got to wrestle it a little bit more, but it doesn't seem to affect their pace as much. You know, I just think it was a, complex, a complexity of things. I think Brad mentally was just, it must have been exhausting riding. You know, we don't know how bad those injuries were. Um, I could just see in those pictures, we posted one of them on, on the Motor Rider World page where, where we said good luck to the boys, even Darren. And Brad just looked defeated. That was the most defeated I'd, I'd, I'd seen Brad look. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm hoping he can bounce back. I know he will bounce. I'm not hoping. I know he will bounce back from that. And I think like your, your, your comment said with 
it's very easy to be that negative clickbait type of person on on Facebook and we'll talk on, on social media in general and we'll talk about Pedro Acosta now. But people weren't talking about how Pedro had beaten Mark Marquez again, Pedro Banyaya again, you know, Jorge Martin again. It was Brad, Brad, Brad. And, and that's what I'm trying to kind of get the point to is, 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 is get away from that. And we will, as Olimoto says, yeah, you know, Olimoto is one of the biggest critics with Brad about stats and, that, and, and in many ways he's right. But then he puts comments like this, which is great. I love the passion for Brad from you guys. You you uh, you give your boy, support him all the way. And that's what we will do. And that's where Andrew Adams, I can understand you, you know, wanting the honesty from us and being a bit more honest as Oli Moto and you do. You know, you've got to look at the stats and Pedro's come in and he's beating him and blah, 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 blah. But there's a bigger picture to it. As you said, if Pedro was on a Honda, would he do it? No. And that's why I said, if you had the honest conversation with Pedro, and I'll I'll try my damnedest to try and get an interview with Pedro that we can do or, or, or something. Pedro will be the first one to say, you know what, I probably wouldn't be, do well, I wouldn't be doing this without Brad. And KTM will be the first one to say, we wouldn't be as competitive as we are without, without Brad. So let's not forget that. Let's move on to Pedro Acosta then, while we're talking about Pedro. Paul, you can't deny that the, the kid is, is supremely talented. Uh, when he went out in FP1 at a tough circuit like Kota, first time on a MotoGP bike there, and he, and he does what he did. I just I remember speaking to my brother and Shez messaged me straight away and went, "How's this kid? How's this? you 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 shouldn't be doing that in modern MotoGP era. It shouldn't happen." And I remember saying to my brother, "I, I can see this kid winning this weekend." That was after one session of watching him. I can see this kid winning, and he just progressed throughout the weekend. And what impresses me so much with this kid. Apart from, as Stephen Berry said, he's just so entertaining to watch. He's got this bruteness. You can see the confidence in his riding style. He's just, and he puts the bike where he wants, and we'll pull apart the riding just now as Shez and I were talking. But what amazes me with this kid is he's doing this without crashing, Paul. Mark Marquez was always on the Honda when he was reinventing MotoGP, but he was finding the limit by crashing. Pedro's doing it without crashing. I don't think he crashed once this weekend. It's 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 mind blowing that this nineteen year old who climbed in onto a Moto three bike for the first time three years ago or whatever it was is now in Moto GP doing what he's doing. It's yeah, I, I I couldn't help this weekend by looking. You know, Portimao was you're already impressed, but you were like, okay, well, do that again. You know, good luck doing that again. And 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 he went a step further. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I became a big Pedro Costa fan, like I'm sure a lot of people did this weekend. Because the way he talks, you know, he he talks with a bit of arrogance, you know, a bit of confidence in himself, you know, like, oh, there's a red, there's not a red Ducati here, now it's a red gas gas. You know, those kind of little comments is arrogance, but it's got a bit of humor to it that you can, you know, relate to. And it's kind of a bit of Marquez and Rossi combined. And you know, he's like the best of all these worlds. And he's he certainly is the, the future of MotoGP. He's certainly going to, he's forcing everyone to take a step up. There's no doubt about that. Not just Brad, he's got everyone thinking. And it's a pleasure to witness uh, th this this new Pedro Acosta in MotoGP, and I'm and I'm glad we're seeing it. And all you can do is just that that that's what we should all be doing instead of pulling it apart. We should all just be doing this. Yeah, absolutely, Rob. Because he's the new generation. He's the whether he wins the championship or wins a race this year is irrelevant. Yeah. He's already proved to every single person who's watched, whether you're a critic or not. How talented and how good he's going to be. Um, I'm just going to go back to Qatar. I remember the interview after the race with Hervé Poncherel. And Hervé said, we've got to teach this kid tyre management. Because remember, he blitzed the first half of the race and then he shot backwards. And in my head, I was thinking, Hervé, how are you going to teach this kid? And after one race, he had learned. Now, how good is that? Anybody who's read the articles about Pedro Acosta, and I can't remember who his crew chief was on Moto2, um, oh, it was Aki Ayo actually said, yes. this is the most mature 18-year-old I've ever met. We spoke to him twice oh, throughout right. the season, yeah. telling yeah. him what to do. Twice. Yeah. The Oaks 18. At 18, what were we doing, Rob? You, yeah. There's no chance you had the maturity to do what he's doing. No. So no. I think that he, he's an 18 now, he's a 19-year-old kid. He's got that exuberance of youth. You see that in his interviews, as you say, maybe a little bit of arrogance. 
but his mental maturity is of a guy who's been racing MotoGP for 10 years yeah. because it took him one race to learn tire control and how to conserve the tire or whatever he needed to learn. One mm -hmm. race. Second race, finishes on the podium. Third, they were blown away. Third race, as you say, probably the most, as the commentators have said, and you've been there, the most physically demanding track. Mm -hmm. And he finishes second. And he wasn't a million miles away from Maverick, who was on his best ever race day in 15 years of motorcycle, of world championship motorcycle racing. He was on his best day. Mm -hmm. And Pedro was second. So listen, this kid is unbelievably good. I do believe it's going to lift the whole. And I'm going to say another thing. The reason why it's, I think the Brad versus Pedro story is because actually it's two KTMs. Yeah. So we've. I think that's where people are, and not worrying about the Ducatis and the Hondas and Yamahas. I don't think anyone worries about the Hondas nowadays. But I think that's why this debate is raging, is because they're on equal machinery. So yeah, but certainly, what a what a sight to behold. And as you say, Rob, from I think the third lap of free practice one, he was actually on pole position, fastest mm -hmm. lap of the morning. You know, which you know, I was expecting him to hover. Eighth, ninth, tenth. No, not this old boy. He doesn't want to go anywhere near double digits. Eh? So, yeah, a supreme talent. Um, only going to get better. There's no doubt. Um, but, yeah, an absolute pleasure to watch. And as you say, no crashes. Doesn't look out of control. I think once over the hill, that fast left-hander, he sort of had a little bit of lose the front a little bit, but just keeps it pegged. Eh? He, you know, as little big media co says, I can't figure out how Pedro is racing that hard all the way to the flag, especially when other riders seem to suffer tire wear. It's supernatural. And this is the thing. He's he's just blown. He's just torn up the rule book. You can't ride close. Your front tire is going to overheat. You can't be that fast for so many laps. Tire management. You, you know, he talks about the interview with they did with Herbert Poncherol where, you know, we've heard a lot of MotoGP riders say, you know, with aero, it makes it hard to pass and turbulence. Pedro's going, yeah, I, yeah, I pass. When I, if I want to pass, I pass. Uh, yeah. and, I, and I watch those onboards where he breaks, and it looks like he's going to just run into the back of the rider. You think this, he's not going to stop the fight. He's T-boning this rider. Not once, not twice, not yeah. every He's T-boning this rider. He's not stop, and, and he stops it, gets it in, and comes out. And you think, but what I will say, watching him, and, and again, Shares pulled it apart, what he does seem to be doing right and that Brad and Jack are maybe doing wrong is, and it could be set up, it could be riding style, it could be one of things. Pedro is getting on the brakes, the bike steps out in this perfect motion, corrects itself, and he, he's got this balance of hard braking and pitching it in at the right time. So he's not putting this pressure on the front tire. Whereas Jack and Brad seem to be going in a lot more snaky, you know, choppy, not settled which, of course, is going to load the front, and, and, and they just can't pull it to where they want it. So he's got that balance of, of corner entry right, and then he just gets the rest right getting out. But his big advantage at Cota was under the braking. I mean, he was out-braking yeah. Martin. He was out-braking. Yeah. He, was, he, he, was he was just phenomenal. So I think it's an absolute treat. I think it's an absolute pleasure to watch the kid, and I'm excited to see what's coming in the future. As you said, I think the biggest headbutt match that comes with us, certainly from – as a South African point of view, a South African friends, why we might slightly get our backs up with him is that, you know, he is stealing a bit of the limelight away from, from Brad. And that, you know, as a fan, you, that gets you. Well, bugger this kid. Our Brad's much better than him. He must piss off, you know. So, but we've got to come to the reality that, as you said, this happens in sport. There's always going to be that young, hard-charging kid, you know, that's going to come and, and, and steal your thunder. It's how you react to it. And as we said, I think Brad's got the mentality to react to this. So, you know, watch yeah. the space. Um, I'm, I'm worried in a way because I don't want that limelight taken away from, from Brad. But knowing Brad, this is just going to fuel the fire and, and, and he's got to react to it now. And I'm excited to see Brad react and KTM react to it because they can't have this red gas gas 19-year-old beating them week in, week out. They can't. That, and Brad won't let it. KTM won't let it. So, um, Andrew... Thank you for your comments. You know, as I said, it, Paul, you, we, we've all said it. It's, it's hard not to get heated sometimes and say things because, you know, we're passionate with this. You know, sometimes this comes into play, but ultimately it's here, you know. So, um, and it is, it, is a, it is a trying time now. Pedro was not supposed to come in 
and yeah. be the, the main KTM boy. He wasn't. Brad was and is supposed to be the KTM challenger this year. And I still have full faith in the fact that he is. He's had two bad weekends. Yes. Let's see how the story unfolds and recovers. And let, let's see the next step there. So um, Rob, I'm glad. Just before, you move, just before yes. you move off of Pedro, yes. go back to middle of last year when Bagnaya was dominating in the long races, not the sprints. Yes. And have a look at his corner entry on that Ducati. Exactly the same thing. As he grabbed the brake initially, the back would step out, but in a very controlled manner. And not as much as Brad Binder was letting it drift out to the side. And Pedro, I was watching it again. I actually rewound it a few times. He's coming into the fast corners exactly like Pecco was riding last year. Maybe they hit in the brake a little bit less violently than Binder. So when Brad's hitting the brake hard on the fast corners, as you said, it's loading the front up, causing the back to step out. But now there's more too much weight on the front. When Pedro seems to be, he's braking equally as hard, but that initial bite is maybe not as aggressive as a guy like Brad. That's what I seem to think. I'd love to see the Brembo data on that initial bite of the break because Pe uh, Peko last year was doing exactly the same. Um, just something that I noticed that corner entry on the fast corners between Peko and uh, Pedro looks identical. Uh, Francois Kutsia, Maysian, I agree with you wholeheartedly, um, although I don't think Miguel, so Francois saying, Rob, he dealt with Miguel Oliveira by working hard and smart and BB33 is a smart rider. I agree with you full and wholeheartedly. I do think Pedro is a much stronger mental and 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 and, and talent-wise compared to, to Miguel. So Brad has got his work cut out, but I agree with you. He, there's no, I have no doubt that Brad can do it. Dave West, come on, Brad. It's crazy. Brad will come good. I agree with you fully there as well. Um, we talked about Maverick Vinales being kind of this dark horse for the championship now. Another person who, again, I have to eat a bit of humble pie so far. That humble pie, I might have to regurgitate it later on in the year because I might be right. And all of us, you know, this is the beauty with MotoGP. It's just, I think it's just going to be this regurgitation. Of, of humble pie because you're going to eat it and you're going to be right and then you're going to bring it up and you're going to be wrong and then you're going to have to eat it again. Um, and they have Bastianini. I kind of said at the beginning of the year, I don't see Bastianini as a title contender. I see him as a rider that's going to win races and podiums. But overall, I just think there's something missing. So far, he's putting it together. He's looking good. He's going about it. He's not setting the world on fire. He's, you know, he's not that guy that you look at on every timing sheet, on every session going, you know, he just kind of sneaks himself in there under the radar. And he did it again on Sunday in, in the main race, certainly, where, you know, consistent. We know Anae has always had this tendency to be really good on, on worn tires and just be able to maintain this great pace. He did it again and top two caddy rider, um, I think second in the world championship now. Um, so yeah, you put his name in the hat for the championship, or is it still a case of right? You know, we, we need to see a little bit more before we can really put that in black and white. Not forgetting that this is a guy that's still very much on a recovery course and playing catch up from what happened last year. Yeah, I think he's caught up, I honestly do. He was good in all the preseason testing, he's been consistent, he's showing us that. He's got back to his old style of riding, exactly that. He's he's happy to run fifth, sixth, seventh for the first half of the race, not let anyone get too far ahead. And then the last third of the race, not last year, the year before on the Pramac bike, he was the master at that. And it seems to be his style. I think he's going to have to adapt a little bit because it's great to say, oh, I came second or third, second or third, second or third. He's, Ducati want to see him winning if he wants to keep his ride. So what he's going to have to do is adapt to the Maverick Vinales this weekend and the Brad Binder next weekend and the Mar Marquez the weekend after. Whoever it is, he can't keep saying, oh, well, the last third of the race, I'll go from fifth to second and everyone will be happy. Because at the end of the year, I think he'll lose his ride. Yeah. So the way he's going about it, I think he's very good. Um, I'm happy to see him up there. In my opinion, at the beginning of the year, I thought uh, Bezeki was going to drill him um, and how those tables have turned. So, um, but yeah, I think Bastianini definitely a dark horse. I think he's, because when he's not injured, he's very consistent, very seldom that he crashes. So I think, and, and now he's ahead of his teammate. So 
This, I think, is going to give him that little bit of a spark that he needs. He also seems to be quite a low reactor kind of guy. Doesn't get all panicky and all a Alicia Spargo shout at mechanics, throw things. Out. He just seems to be a guy who deals with whatever's on his plate and goes. So I think he's definitely, I'm glad to see him in the mix. It's nice to see. And I, I honestly think he deserves it. And I hope he keeps it going. I'm a big fan of Ana Bastianini. I love the whole look and feel of his. I love his logo, the beast, the bastard, the, the, the pink that he brings in, the color. I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on the Ducati want him to win. And I, Shez and I spoke about it last week as well. I still think he will stay at Factory Ducati. I, we'll talk about the Martin conversation just now. I think Ducati won Pecco, obviously beating Anaya week in, week out. They won Pecco number one. You know, Anaya, they want him to be the perfect teammate that we can manage in the corner, win a couple of races, a couple of podiums. But, you know, yeah, give us that. But our main boy is Pecco. So I don't know. I don't think they're enjoying this, this seeing Anaya Bastianini beating Pecco. Um, 100 percent but, but but he's beating peco it's not like yeah. like yeah, yeah, yeah. peco's thrown it. so yeah. exactly what you say ducati are going to be in turmoil in five races time if this continues mm -hmm. i olimoto says yeah I, and, and it all depends on how 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 much martin has tarnished with what he said you know to ducati by saying if you don't take me i'll go somewhere else it's whether Ducati are going to jump it and go, oh, we can't lose a Martin, which, okay, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, I feel for Bastianini in a way because I, I do think Ducati obviously give him the support that he wants. But I still, you know, the more I think of it now, and I go back to Ducati making the decision to take Anaya over Martin, and it's starting to, yeah, Anaya at the time, they said, yeah, because he won more races or whatever they, they said. They they went on performance. I honestly th think they went because he was an easier rider to manage, an easier personality to manage. And I'm starting to see that now. Yes, they celebrated his podium and it was great. Did you see as much as of Gigi and, and you know, them? Or not see with Bashanini as you would opposed to, you know, Pecco. Those are the first characters you see there. I'm not saying that they, they don't want Bashanini to do well and whatever. I just think Pecco's number one, Anaya's number two. Great. Anaya put out Ducati on the podium when Pecco couldn't. Great. But bugger that, we need to get Pecco performing and winning races. So I just I, I worry about how much how much support in that regard Anaya will get compared compared to Pecco. I think Pecco is still going to get that support, and it's great that Anae is performing, but don't perform too well because Pecco is still our main guy. That, that, that's how I see it. I agree 100%. I'm just happy that he's there and he's yeah. doing well. And, and I agree with your sentiment that 100% that to manage Pecco and then have a Martin at the same time is going to be... So, I mean, that we're going to chat about, and, and during the year it's going to get even worse, but I just think that uh, me, I'm happy to see that he's back to where he should be because he's a supreme talent as well, as is Bezeki, who I'm very disappointed in. But So I'm happy for Bastianini, certainly posing a massive problem for Ducati, and you're 100% right. Their support, if you had to put it down on paper and they had to commit to it, they would all write down Peko. So mm. I understand that. That's what being in a factory team and having a number one and a two is all about. Hmm. But he's just turning the table a little bit on the number one at the moment. Look, we're only three races in, um, but still he's performing and the star is, by their standards, underperforming. So it's going to create a, you know, if it carries on, it's going to create a bit of a conundrum for Ducati. But I agree with you. They would like to keep him as the number two rider because it's easy to manage. But then Peko is going to have to up his game because at the moment he's, He's not the Peko of last year. He, he seems to be under pressure. And a lot of great comments here coming in from Oli Moto with this regard. Dave West, Luca Jefferson, um, uh, Tafik, uh, Ojoa, I hope I said that right, uh, Sven Grun. A lot of people coming in with some great comments with regard to that. Pretty much the same kind of sentiments, but at the same time, you know, Anaya, Peko's won two world titles, Anaya and Martin haven't, so you can understand why Ducati have gone that way. But Olimoto makes like a very good point 
with with what we're saying about Ducati wanting to manage two relationships. That do they want to put themselves in a situation that Yamaha Yamaha had where you got Rossi and Lorenzo, you got to you got to manage that. Whereas right now it's a lot easier to manage a Peko and a Nea compared to a a Peko and Martin. And let's bring that into the conversation now with Martin before we get into the performances and stuff. Let's talk about Martin. Come out saying now at Cota. I'll definitely not be with Premac next year. And we kind of knew that. Um, putting the pressure on Ducati, if you don't take me, I'm going somewhere else. And this is the conversation again I had with Shares. And Ducati, can, Ducati are holding the, the, the ball here. Because Ducati can go, you know what? Go then. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? You, if you go to Aprilia, great, but you're going to be paid a lot less. Four million is, is clearly kind of Aprilia's you know, highest that they'll go. Are Aprilia ready to win a world championship yet? Do Aprilia have the power? Do Caddy do? There's a lot of arguments there. Okay, where else are you going to go? Okay, Yamaha sorted. They've got rings and things. So your next best option. And, you know, Martin's that kind of personality that I can see take the challenge on is go Honda. Repsol will open that checkbook. He'll get his 15, 16 million, whatever he wants. It's Honda would be stupid not to go to Martin with a blank check and say, you tell us what you want. You know, Honda, again, proved this weekend that they are miserably behind. They are, they are, they are even further behind than I think we all thought, to be honest. Um, so is Martin arrogant, brave enough to do that over Ducati? I, I just, I can't see Ducati giving in to Martin. I think Ducati have got too much power. They've got a Foster Nea, they've got a Fost Peko, they've got a Fost, you know, Bedzeki that they just need to sort out. They've got the option of Mark Marquez to potentially put in, in that ride. Frankie, okay, that's still a, a hard topic to have Frankie because of everywhere. So you kind of, we, we said it a couple of races ago, we'll give Frankie, you know, four or five races before we can really start talking about him. So Ducati, do they need a Martin? Uh, that's the argument I have with Martin. Has he shot himself in the foot? Don't bite the hand that feeds. And I think he's bitten that hand, and, and that hand's got the power. And I can see that hand going, you know what? Go to Honda. Go to Aprilia. And Rob, anyone whose interviews you've read or listened to or seen articles about who have negotiated with Ducati, it's been on mm -hmm. Ducati's terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. including the great Casey Stoner, including Valentino Rossi. It was never dictated on their terms. It was dictated mm -hmm. on Ducati's terms. Mm -hmm. So here's a rider who's kind of said, well, I'm the guy you want. He's telling them. He's not asking them. And <clears throat> I agree with you. So he's, he's, he said he's, he's not staying at Pramac, mm -hmm. which to me, he's, he's shot himself neither in the head, never mind the foot. He's mm -hmm. got the best bike. He's leading the championship. Is he going to end up in the factory Ducati team? Unless something's been promised to him behind the scenes? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. To manage the personalities, we've discussed it. He's going to want to go to Ducati as the number one rider. He's not going to go there and say, well, I'm happy to get the factory bike, but I'll suck hind boob to old um, Peko. It's not going to happen. I can't see it happening. So what is he going to do? I think Aprilia would be quite a good move for him, but it's not going to be an open checkbook. Um is money that important? Well, I, th I, I always said, no, these guys want to win championships. But Fabio blew that theory out of the water. Mm -hmm. I understand in two years' time, just changing the tack a bit. When his contract with Yamaha expires, he'll only be 26. Lots of time left. So he's made the moolah. Now he can win championships then. Pedro's going to slaughter him by then. Anyway, so what's Martin going to do? Could go to Aprilia. Is there a possibility that he goes to a KTM or a Gas Gas? Very little has been mentioned about that. So I don't know if that's on the cards. Mm -hmm. Remember, there was more talk at the end of last year about Marquez going to KTM stroke gas gas and now possibly MV if that's going to happen. Nobody's talking about that with Martin. So I think he shot himself in the foot regarding a Ducati ride. I don't know if you'd want to go to Honda. Yes, money-wise, you'd take the deal that offer him an open checkbook. But what's he going to achieve? You know, so I don't know. Um, uh, it's going to be, if he happens to go to the factory Ducati, I think that will be the the what the, the what exclusive of the year. You know, the biggest jaw-dropping signing because I can't see that happening. And that's all he actually wants. I think uh, he's obviously not going to walk away from the sport, but I think in the back of my, in his mind, he's kind of, well, if I don't get that, I'll, I'll go take my ball and go play somewhere else. I, um, I just see Martin as that, 
that arrogant to go, you know what, Ducati, I'll show you. I'll go win on a Honda. You know, I, I, that's why I could see that happening. But as Andre Calvert mentions here, you know, him and Alicia Spargo are, are great Chinas. Alex will retire and give his seat to his main guy, Martin. The, the problem there is, only drawback there is, I think, financial. I think Martin's going to look at it and he'll probably have to take a pay cut on what he's at, uh, you know, a satellite Ducati team. Hence why I think the Honda move is probably the more likely because Honda will go all out. They'll roll out a plan to him and say, you know, we're throwing money at this. We're throwing resources. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do this. And I think Martin's arrogant enough. Although, again, he could be arrogant enough going, you know what? Cool. I'll take a little bit of a pay cut and go to Aprilia. Be their, their main boy. I'm, I'm seeing what Maverick's doing. The bike's clearly getting better. I could see Martin being really quick on an Aprilia as well. Um, but as you said, and a lot of people are commenting here, I don't think we're going to see uh, Morgan. I'd be very surprised to see Martin in factory colors. Zama, I agree with you. Martin just needs to talk less and keep his momentum. That factory seat is fitting for him based on his performances, but his attitude may prove a little defuse for that emotional team. And that's exactly kind of, kind of what we're saying. So it's a big topic. Um, the Martin and where he's going and how to carry on a handle it. Another big topic is this this Martin 2.0 that we seem to have on a racetrack. Yeah, okay, the sprint race, you know, the Martin is still there. The Sunday, I'm seeing a different Martin because, again, he, he kind of didn't play it right in terms of went too early, burnt his tires a bit and had to kind of settle back and, and ultimately finish fourth and off the podium, which for Martin would have killed him. But at the same time, he was ahead of Peko, which I think is still his number one aim. If I can't win, I've got to beat Peko. Yeah, and he did that. So there's definitely this, this shift. I could, you know, last year's Martin, I could see pushing and, and crashing in that situation or burning his tires completely and finishing 10th. So there's certainly this, this better, you know, version of Martin in the overall championship picture because he did the right thing this weekend. I didn't have the pace. So let me finish fourth and take the points. So <laughs> it's a tough one to now pull apart, Martin, because in one way he's too arrogant and shut your mouth and I don't like what you're saying and you're being an idiot. Premek have done so much for you and just to dismiss them like that's a bit horrible and, 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 and. But then there's this other side that he's doing everything right to be a world champion on track. Yeah, I'm, I'm also I'm betwixt and between with this guy. When you listen to his interviews after the race, he comes across as, I'm going to say, not arrogant. He tells you how the right, you can see he's happy, he's yeah. he's motivated, he's had good results. Good it's what he's saying in the press and behind the scenes that comes across as arrogant. Mm -hmm. And specifically with the story saying, well, I'm not going to be at Pramac, that's almost a given. But is it because Pramac have said to him, listen, we're done with you. You can move on. We actually don't care. We don't know. So I, I'm, a, I, I'm not too sure. He's got the arrogance of a world championship leading rider. He is the world championship leader. So I, I'm not too sure. I, I definitely think because of what he said two years ago when he didn't get the factory ride and last year when he was in the hunt and he said, well, I don't have to win this championship. Peko has to. to. That's the arrogance that I don't like that, you know, where he's almost got an F you attitude to everyone. And that's the arrogance I don't like with him. But right now, I'm seeing a Peko, as you say, he finished fourth as opposed to trying to win the race and destroying a tyre and finishing 10th a la Australia last year. Mm. He's, when you listen to the interviews with Fonzie Nieto, he also seems to have come down a peg. And they're talking to the journalists now, not kind of, what did the word be, prescribing to them. Just mm. seems to be that team or his management have had a little bit of a let's get together and, you know, let's act like big boys now because we can do this. We came close last year, then we blew it. Let's not do that this year. So, I'm all, as I say, I'm, 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 I'm hot and cold with him. Um, sometimes I'm really I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed at what he says. And then other times I think, but you come across as quite a normal, you know, he's winning the world championship. He's the best MotoGP rider as of the end of Kota's weekend. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss actually what to say, but I still think what we're saying that he won't be in the factory team, I'm kind of going to stand by that because I think he's difficult to manage. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Berry, I agree with your side note. Martin went into turn one 
uh, and nearly took out the whole field. So you can still see he's he's got that fight in him, Martin, that he seems to have managed a bit better, although that move was a little bit harsh. And, you know, talking about the Brad Binder, we forget that Brad was on the outside of all of those guys and got ran off track. And, you, you know, if, if you're really looking at the, the Brad Binder picture, he was really derailed in turn one already coming from 17th. But Martin still has this bit of aggression that this time didn't get him into big trouble, but he's still got to kind of, you might look at that afterwards and go, because I looked at it and went, geez, you know, that you could have ended it all there and then in turn one at the start of the race, but he got away with it this time. But yeah, that's, you know, a lot of people also are bringing in the Yamaha conversation into this. Could Pramac be going Yamaha? Um, and, you know, could Rins be moved from Monster Energy into this Pramac Yamaha, Martin into factory Yamaha? Have Yamaha got that budget to kind of pay uh, Fabio the 14 million or whatever he and a Martin at 12 million? Do they want to manage those two personalities? I can't see that happening, to be honest. Um, there's a big conversation we'll have just now regarding Yamaha and Lynn Jarvis, of course, that we've got to mention as well. But yeah, the Martin's a tricky one. And how's that going to play on his mind? kind of not knowing where he's going yet and being snubbed by Ducati again, you know, is that going to motivate him to, I will show you Ducati what you're missing and I'm going to win this year on a, you know, a private Ducati team on a factory bike, uh, nevertheless. But there's all these factors that, that we're going to be talking about with Martin and it's how he handles all that outside information, gets a job done on the track. And that's what, he, that's what he impressed me with Sunday is there's all this going on and, a, and an old Martin and, and many other riders would buckle under all that kind of confusion and, and kind of interaction and interference coming in from the outside. Martin kept his head in many ways. And you saw that carrot, especially with the Pedro Acosta, it must be killing all these guys seeing this 19-year-old destroying them, you know, especially an arrogant Martin. Like you, I'm the Spaniard that's supposed to be in the headline, not yeah. Vinales and especially a 19-year-old Pedro. So he kept his calm about him. Which, which which was a good thing. So, but yeah, it, it, it's a discussion I think we're going to be having week in, week out about this way. You know, every year brings us, who, who's this big rider going where? And Martin is certainly that 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 big talking point for, for what's going to happen with him with him next year. It's, it's how he manages the off-track stuff on track. At the moment, he's doing a good job, but, but that can change. Remember he's, one thing as well, Rob, on Saturday after he had his second crash in free practice, in uh, qualifying two, when he ran into the garage, he was the one telling the team to calm down. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that. He yeah. was saying to him, just calm down, calm down, which normally I think the, the Martin of 18 months ago would have run in there, just get me on the second bike, I'm going out. Does it? He was the one who was actually like, boys, let's just you know, we're okay. Calm down. We've got time. We've got a time on the board. It's not a great one, but just, you know, so something to bear in mind. There's definitely been a mind shift there, 100%. The, 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 and I'm going to call him a kid. He's 23 years old. He's thinking the right way to win a world championship. I think he's thinking long game. And maybe he's not letting all the other distractions distract him, but I do think he's the main card for once he makes a decision i think a lot of other decisions will be made in terms of contracts being signed and because let's be quite honest out of everyone who's got a contract available he must be the one that everyone would want he must be the draw card so i think that's how it's going to pan out i don't believe it's going to wait till you know he's not going to have a no ride the longer he waits i don't think anyone's got a ride until martin puts pen to paper so uh, ray Coropus, I hope I said that right. It's just made the best comment, and we might as well just end the show there. Brad, 2024 champion. Shall we just leave it there? Done. <laughs> Done. I know everyone's going to bombard comments now. Oh, Rob, we loved you, and now we hate you again. Who is the um, guy you're fighting with, Steve? He's going to be like kicking away on the keyboard. No, I'm just joking. Great, great comment there, Ray. Love, love the positivity. Let's move on to Peko Banyaya quickly. Um, was talking big at the beginning of the year. This bike feels the best ever. I love it. Blah, 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 blah. Yes, 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 yes. Hasn't translated quite to results yet. There's still, there seems to be this very hesitant Peko Banyaya, even on that Sunday race, got a good start and thought, okay, you know what, sprint race wasn't great, but here's, you know, Sunday man Peko again. Wasn't really there. Something is not quite there. What I do like about the Peko exercises. He doesn't seem to be letting it get to him. He's kind of going, okay, 
you know, it's a long season, eh, which I don't know if I'm happy about or not, you know, I don't know how to kind of take it. Should they be more, more worried? Have they got it under control? Because on paper, you know, results and championship not going to plan, but they don't seem to be panicking, which makes me not panic, if you know what I mean. Yeah, definitely. Remember, and it's an old cliche saying for motorbike racing, and I can't remember who coined the phrase, but you don't win your championships on your good days. You win them on your bad days. Yeah. So he's managing his bad days. However, I've noticed Portima and this weekend and both sprint races, he's getting beaten up. Yeah. And he normally doesn't. He normally gets into his position, and it's very difficult to have any kind of scrap with him. But this last weekend specifically, sprint race and the main race, he got beaten up a good couple of times. And I wonder if that's playing on him mentally, where last year, to be quite honest, the main fight came from George Martin, Jorge. But once he got ahead of Martin, he, he seemed to be able to pull that half a second to a second gap and settle into a rhythm and nothing upset him. When now he's, he's getting beaten up and it doesn't seem like he's coping with that too well. And I mean, Pedro, Martin passed him. Bastianini, uh, you know, Bastianini passed him. So he's suddenly got a little bit of a fight on his hands and in the past he's dealt with it but it's only generally been Jorge Martin now there's three other guys four guys I can't remember at the, at the end of uh, lap one if, if Mark Marquez was ahead or behind him I can't remember uh, but he's certainly getting beaten up and it looks like that's where he's at the moment just struggling a little bit just my observation. I don't think he's, he knows what he's doing. Maybe it was just one of those days where he said, it's the best I'm going to get. So we settle for the points and we move to the next race. Absolutely. Tulani, uh, Darren Binder, we will briefly touch upon Daz later in the show because it is a talking point, especially for us uh, South African fans. So we will bring that in. Um, so just stay tuned. Bear with us. I know we're an hour and 11 minutes in, but there's just so much to talk about. We really could be here for days. Um, let's move on to Mark Marquez before we get into a couple of other little talking points. Mark Marquez, a big talking point. Um, Kota, you know, Mr. Kota, King of Kota, came in. Every, you know, we were all kind of singing. Everyone was kind of saying on a Ducati. For years, we said Mark on a Ducati, Kota would be unstoppable. Um I liked a lot of what I saw from Mark this weekend. There was a little bit of a rider you know, style change, adapting to the bike a bit more. Still a bit loose in many ways, but there was a lot of positive I saw out of Mark. Great sprint race, even though he said there was a lot that went wrong and he wasn't 100% comfortable to still get on the podium. Was good. Um, top to caddy uh, again, I think. But competitive on this. You know, in the worst Ducati team, if there is such a thing, but competitive, great. I loved, 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 loved that scene of that kid going to Mark, Mark sitting with him on the stage. Yeah, and it's easy to do when you're happy. Yes, I, I, I know all that. But Mark hugging him, having that conversation, taking him, giving. I, just, I that's what that, that's just Mark. Mark is love him or hate him, respect the guy. You know, he what he's been through. Everything he's been through, how much grief he's there. The guy was sitting with a MotoGP fan and giving him that time. Yes, the cameras were on him and that he still didn't have to do it. He did it. After that, smiley, happy Mark again, singing or, you know, dancing with the, the entertainer on stage. Just great to see a Mark Mark is smiling. It, it, it really is. It, it, it amplifies MotoGP even more for me. Um, but then there was this mistake on Sunday, this, this Mark Mark is mistake that you know, we do this. Um, but many, in many ways, it's the same kind of, for me as, as Pedro, you know, it's race by race. And this is what impresses me with Pedro. He's not crashing doing this while a Mark, you know, is. But I was impressed with Mark. I, I really was impressed with Mark. How he was there, still learning the Ducati, but he made his presence felt mixing it with the, the, the factory Ducati guys who have got all this experience on the bike. Brian Ritchie, brake failure. Yeah, apparently, you know, he, he brake, brake came to, to the handlebar because over the bump, so he had to like re-pump it. And, and that's because it was a it was a weird crash. I don't think he was going in miles quicker than he had been. It, it, it did look like something like that where, you know, just too much brake and down he goes. And what amazes me is the guy brakes with one finger he gets that much pressure to tuck a front end like that. that 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 amazes me the most but yeah 
yes, I know you landed up on the floor and everyone's like, ah, Mark crashed again. I don't look at it like that. I look at it as, you know what? This guy's, again, only going to get better, only going to get faster. And I think it's a matter of time before this guy's winning winning races and consistently finding a bit more form in the Ducati and making the championship more exciting. Rob, so at what point do we say he stopped learning the Ducati? Or, he, you know, he, he, we keep saying he's still learning stuff. At what point do we say, okay, he's had four practice, four test days, three test days, or three test weekends. He's had three races. I'm just playing, and I'm a Mark Marquez fan. I'll yeah. put it out there. I don't mind saying that. I think MotoGP's moved ahead of where Mark Marquez was before he broke his arm. I honestly believe that. He still got the speed. He was the only rider on the weekend who overtook everybody except for Maverick. I don't think if Mark hadn't have crashed, I don't believe he would have won. The yeah. pace Maverick had was just mm. unbeatable. Mm. My point is, I'm going to say, I think Mark is now settling in nicely on this bike. He's comfortable. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm. I'm a bit critical when a guy makes a mistake and blames the brakes. I'm not saying that wasn't the issue. I think he's just. He made a mistake and he crashed. However, go back to the four laps before that. Pedro passed him. He passed him straight back. He passed whoever was ahead of him. At one stage, he lost half a second. Took him one lap. He closed the gap where other riders couldn't do that. So he's certainly he's looking very comfortable. I think he looks very smooth compared to when he rode the Honda. And go back to even pre his injury, almost every lap you thought this oak was going to crash because he was just out of shape. He doesn't look like that on the Ducati at all. I know and I, I think he is still adapting his style. My point is I don't know if he's going to win another world championship. I think, And I'd love him to. But I think MotoGP has moved the goalpost. And that was thanks to Ducati being so much better than the Honda in the three injury years for Marc Marquez. And he lost out on that. He'll adapt. He'll win races. He'll be at the front. Can he win a championship? First time this weekend, I had my doubts. Because I also thought, Kota, ah, man, they might as well just give him the trophy now and everyone can stay at home. I actually, I think he was a little bit, when I say exposed, you know, we're talking about an eight times world champion, but against the best riders in the world. So, and, and he was the one who crashed. Pedro didn't crash. Maverick didn't crash. Bastianini didn't crash. I don't know. I, I'm, I, I love seeing him up there, um, but he, he can't do this. You know, he's had two non-finishers. Yes, whatever your opinion is of Portimao, was it his fault? Was it Bagnaz? Was it 50 50s? Irrelevant. There's no remarks on the score sheet. He got nil point. Nil point again at Cota. You can't win a championship, and he knows that. So, yeah, interesting to see. I definitely think he's going to be in the mix, but is he going to be in the mix week in and week out? Time will tell. Jesus. Paul, are you going to get the Mark Marquez tattoo removed off your arm or what? No. <laughs> Not yet. Eh? Not yet. Like, I, 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 in some ways, I agree with you. And in some ways, I don't. I, I see something big coming from Mark. I see him all of a sudden just really clicking with the whole operation, crew chief, team, bike. I think I, I see everything coming together and Mark, you know, just being massively competitive week in week in week out whether he's going to win another championship you know i'm very much on the fence with that uh, i can see him not i can see him so again it's, it's it's a big gray area for me um i'm just happy to see him performing i'm happy to see him running at the front but having said that you know um we can say that as you said we can say he's still adapting to the the caddy and 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 and, and, and pedro costas you know, doing the right things and not crashing. Vinales is doing the right. So yeah, him landing on his head again, whether it's brake fade problems or whatever, whatever, he crashed. He got no points. He so so there is that 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 mark in the you know is you did this right, you did this right, you did this right. But when it came down to it, the biggest thing you had to do right, you didn't do right. So yeah. there there is that argument. Um, yeah, that that question of at what point do we say, okay, Mark, listen, you've had enough time now you've got to start performing you, you, I, I would say it's it's from now um you know pedro and pedro is proving that no one's saying i'll oh, give pedro more time you know, pedro's, <laughs> pedro's thrown that out to, that, this is the problem this is the thing this yeah. is the thing with pedro pedro's throwing a lot of the stuff out pedro's throwing that you need time you can't 
he's thrown that all out the window. And this is what's elevating MotoGP. And this is what's putting, you know, in some ways, watching Brad on the weekend, again, putting, you know, the journalist cap on, I could see a rider, a panicked rider out there. I could see a rider and a team panic, in panic mode, the way they were performing and overriding the bike, especially in, in Q1 when he, you know, right, you've got to go on your second bike and you've got to put in a lap time. That was probably one of the scrappiest laps I've ever seen from Brad. You know, it, it was it was panic mode on the bike. He, it clearly wasn't set up. He said, you know, he, the one bike was set up one way, the other bike was set up the other way. The, the crash wasn't supposed to happen. So that derailed things. But I just saw a panicked environment from, from Brad and KTM over, over that weekend, whether the, the injury, whatever. In some ways, I saw the same from Mark with some of those moves, like that, that move on Martin on the inside of the last turn. You know, they were coming together with Jack. There was this pen. There was this almost like, okay, I'm at Cota. I have to win on this Ducati. Move out of my way. You know, yeah. so there was a bit of fluster there. Um, and I understand all the arguments here, you know, Francois and, and Stephen Berry, it's it's you know, muscle memory or Honda muscle memory. He's still got to get out of him. Uh, Pedro's kind of dismissed that. And Mark, I think he's better than. So I think that was just your you panicking, Rob, says Stephen Berry. I, I think it was. But I don't know. The, I took a lot of positives this weekend watching watching Mark. I, I love what he did off track that moment and whatever, but on track, I took a lot of positives. But there needs to be this, as you said, there needs to be this time where, right, you've got to start putting points on the scoreboard and, and, and you know, getting things right. Time Time's not waiting for you. And is it a case of MotoGP's moved too far on for him? Pedro Acosta made the comment of Mark will never have the same strength in his arm. That's always going to be a handicap for him. At this level of MotoGP, yes. So, yeah, agree to disagree with you kind of on that one, if if, if you know what I mean. And, and I'm just going to go back to my comments that I made a short while ago. That was speaking with my head. Yes. If you'd like to hear my comments with my heart, <laughs> then it's a different debate altogether. But, yeah, look, make no mistake, Mark is performing. I think he's performing to what would have been – most people's expectations of him give him a couple of weeks to settle in a couple of races get to know different tracks the bike but he's mark marquez he's a phenomenon he's he's what pedro costa is today was mark marquez in 2013 the year he moved to moto gp um so i i, I do think that 100 percent he's in the mix i'm not discounting him for one second but he's gonna have to like we say do a Bagnaya, and if you have to look, it's not his DNA. His DNA is not to finish fifth. And I told you a few weeks ago, I bought that book that I read of his, and it's called How I Win My Race. It doesn't say how I win the race. Mark Marquez looks after Mark Marquez. I mentioned that, yeah. and in a in a in a way that is applicable to his racing, you know. So I think he needs to maybe is it he needs to settle down and take. I don't. It's not going to happen. Read the book. Read anything about Mark Marquez. Mark's mentality is there to win. He is he's never shied away from that. So I think it's quite a difficult thing for him to, if he is having a bit of a break problem, say, okay, I'm going to drop back three places and I'll bring it home in fourth. He's like, no chance. I'm ahead of all you oaks. I've just passed three of you in the last two laps. There's no ways you're beating me. And I think that's his mentality. You know, in all fairness, he's got nothing to prove. He has. He's moved to Ducati. He wants to be a world champion again. But does he need to prove that? I don't know. You know, that's you know, it's such a it's such a is it your head or is it your heart debate with him? Because you love him or you hate him. But you've got to acknowledge he's probably, if not the best, he's certainly the top three that has ever raced a motorcycle before. So um, but yeah, uh, my point again, when do we say, okay, you should know this bike now? Let's see you win some races. I, I said, I'll, and I'll stick to my point, Mugello, by Mugello, he will have won a race. Let's see if that happens. Uh, so just to quickly rewind a little bit before we move on, and I want to get moving on, um, a good comment here a couple of people make with regards to, to Pedro Acosta, what he's getting right, and maybe the factory KTM team aren't. Wayne Taylor mentioned, I think it was Wayne, mentioned it earlier. Pedro has come out and said, and the team have come out and said, we, we actually hardly have changed the setup since the start of the season from Qatar to now for Pedro. He's, you know, he's kind of kept that one or two small changes, but he's kind of adapted himself to to that. Right, let me make this work rather than let make the bike work for me. 
And maybe that's what KTM are getting wrong because we hear, you know, we've certainly heard and seen that the factory KTM team, there's a new part coming in almost every weekend. And, and are they are they just going up and down? And rather than just settling and saying, right, this worked, let's just go with that. And let's change, you know, Brad's riding style or let's change things to, to work with this rather than this, the bike, work for us. And in many ways, you know, from the outside, you know, we don't know how much Brad and them are changing internally and how up and down they are going. But certainly what's being portrayed to us is that the factory team are changing a lot. You know, we're going up, Jack Miller says it all the time. We go this way, we go this way. You know, Brad and the team proved it by, right, number one bike was set up this way. So when he crashed that, climbed on the number two bike and it just didn't work because they are just so up and down. Do they need to level things and say, right, that's it. Now we've made the decision for the next three race meetings. This is going to be our setup. And we've got to adjust ourselves to that rather than that to us. Don't know. I, I wish we had the insight to know because if you listen to Simon Crayfall when he's walking up and down the pits and then he'll say, okay, I've noticed on this bike they've it's got a longer swing arm. It's got a shorter wheelbase. They've dropped the forks. They've, you know, there's, there's, you know, Rob, you've raced. There's a billion things that you can do on a super bike. Imagine what you can do on that factory MotoGP bike where you've got the best of the best, you know, changing the linkage, changing the fork springs. You, you know, now you, you, you've also got limited time. So you can't say, well, I'm going to go and do 30 laps on this and see it. You've got three or four laps at best. Then you've got to come in make a decision and then go again and in the interim someone might have crashed so those laps don't cr count you know it's a, the pressure must be immense especially if you don't feel you're going in the right direction because now you've gone a so you don't try b you try z and it's exactly the wrong way now you've got to go back to b and try you know so uh, the pressure must be immense especially when you're kind of not exactly sure of where you're going but i think you're quite right choose a base setting that's worked to a point and maybe make incremental changes, whatever those might be to the bike and see how that goes for a weekend or two. But you see, they can't do that because they, they then see the Ducatis running three tenths of a second faster and they're like, we off the pace here, we need to improve. So yes, it, the pressure must be unbelievable on everyone. That's the thing we, we are, and that's something we as fans will never understand that pressure. We can comment and think we know what we're talking about and what's going on. We'll, we'll never understand that, you know, and that's and that's where we'll never be able to kind of, you know, speak or relate to that kind of level of performance and pressure and everything that's going on there. Uh, a quick little comment here from Stephen Berry. Rob, any idea why Simon was declined a visa? Obviously, Simon Crayfar wasn't there. There's been two conflicting stories, and I don't know if the declined visa was just a PR stunt because the, the, the a lot of the story that I'm hearing from a lot of people on the inside was that Dorna just didn't want to pay his flights and his accommodation, which I do also find strange because surely, surely, you know, Simon's part of the circus and one of the main acts. You don't not bring one of your main acts. So I don't know. I don't know what happened there, to be honest. Um, right, let's move on here quickly because we, we get, are we still going to talk about Darren. Someone's asked if we oh, Don't forget Darren. We will. Um, sixth place in the main race. Paul, you, your man, DJ Antonio. Um, impressed. We'll quickly talk about him. Our Chinese teammate once again, the fourth best to caddy, VR46's top man from a rider that wasn't going to be in the in the paddock this year. Well, you know, he's been. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, he's been disappointing this year, but he hasn't. I think everyone else has up their game, and we've thrown a Pedro Costa and a Mark Marquez into the mix on a more consistent basis. But as you say, he's, he's, he's hammering his teammate, which I certainly couldn't have seen happening. With one race to go last year, he had no ride. So he's really done himself a, a, a justice by getting into that team. And he's proving that he's worth it. You know, um, if you have a look at the both the um, uh, Marquez's bikes finished behind him. Okay, Alex Crash managed to get up. On, I think he finished 15th. But um, De Gian Antonio, and I said it last year, this kid is good. He just, he's now struggling to put the, where did he win last year? It was at Qatar last year. Remember, it was the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's struggling to put that 
just getting into the top five together. But I mean, he's making Q2, I'm going to say almost comfortably. So yeah, I think he's he's solid. Eh? He's, he's doing exactly what the team would have wanted of him, except beating his teammates. I'm 100, because maybe he's not a VR46 academy rider. They would have, under no circumstances, would have they have thought, listen, this is going to be beating our boys. But yeah, he's certainly uh, consistent, you know. Needs to move one or two places up. You've said it all the time, Rob, that mental shift from finishing where he was, okay, he's improved dramatically from 13th, 14th, 15th, that mental shift to move to now he's top six-ish. Now I think it's not a speed issue. I think it's a mental shift yeah. to get to where the Pecos, Maverick on the weekend, the Marks, the Pedros, I, I think he can do it. He needs to do it more consistently. So, But yeah, I'm impressed with him. I like the kid and I, I think a well-deserved choice to put him on that bike. Absolutely. Uh, seventh place, Alicia Spargro. You know, uh, he got tangled up in the turn one melee and a good ride back into seventh place, 12 seconds off of the leader, which was his his teammate and winner. You know, that's maybe where he'd be scratching his head a little bit is, you know, where was Maverick so much better than me? I think Alish certainly on track performances this year, it's going to be very much that up and down. I don't think he's going to set the world alight. I think he's just, I think he's playing out the final year of his racing career. To be honest, um, I, I still think he's doing a stellar job between managing the having his kids and, and you know, being a dad and racing at the highest level of that MotoGP has ever been at. So I'll always have that respect for him. I think the big talking points with Aleish this year will maybe be off track where he does these kind of silly comments and shouts at his team and whatever. But nevertheless, you know, okay weekend again for Aleish in, in, in seventh. Yeah, I think it's, it's probably par for the course for him. Um, just a point that you've highlighted, and Shays actually mentioned it last weekend, uh, last week when you chatted about Aprilia's test rider, Lorenzo Savadori, who was Shays' teammate. Imagine now they're going to move a leash into that role mm. and they put a guy like Jorge yeah. Martin on that bike. You know, that will, yes, that will be a game changer for Aprilia, I believe. So, you know, let's see how it pans. Definitely, Aleish is thinking along those lines. He's been making those comments. So it certainly seems like he's in the twilight of his career, probably riding the best he's ever ridden. Um, but yeah, I think I think that would be a, a, a good send-off for him, put him in a good position, let him manage the building up of the team going forward, but not at a race level. So yeah, let's see how it pans out. But I think seventh par for the course for him. And I think these test rider roles are, are really attractive for the like of Alasia Spargo. You look at Paul and them now. You get to pick and choose your races. Cool, I'm going to go race at Jerez. And I don't have to do all this travel to, to Thailand and Kota and, and all that kind of rigorous stuff. You know, yeah. I can do my testing, which is hard. It's a hard job. You've got to go and just do laps and laps and laps. But then you still get to race because, you know what, cool. I like I really like Jerez. Let's go race at Jerez or Catalonia and stuff. So I think it will fit, uh, you know, Aleish and where he is in his career at the moment. A bit more time with the family, but you're still in that that racing world and you're not forgotten about yeah, you still get to, you still kind of get to take that dose of your drug you know if you know what i mean um yeah. marco bedzek in eighth place is 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 the big head scratcher at the moment he's come out saying he doesn't have the same kind of feel uh with this new bike as he did the old bike but you know i, I worry that if he doesn't find something soon he's he's quickly becoming almost like a franco the forgotten guy you kind of have to remind yourself to to look at at, at bedzeki whereas you know and this is this is six months on from a guy that finished third in the world championship last year and made the decision to stay with the team because he was comfortable and, and, and got given the newer spec bike, which is, it's just, something's not working. That VR46 team in a way, you know, we just spoke about Digi kind of flying the flag for him, but Bedzeki and the team in some way just seem to have lost something. Yeah, we've discussed it, Rob. Is it because Rossi has now taken a back step? Is it... Um... Is, is there a bit of a fallout between them? Because Peko is now the golden boy. Remember, he's part of the VR46 Academy. Is he being treated differently? I don't know. Um, just remember in this race, this past weekend, the main race, Bezeki was actually the last of the Ducatis. He was fortunate in that Alex Marquez crashed and Mark Marquez crashed. But other than that, he was at the back of the grid because Alex Marquez was ahead of him before he crashed. So, yes, I understand. You've got to bring the bike to the end. We've discussed that many times. But he knows that ultimately he was the worst of the Ducatis. And I, you know, I don't know what's going on. He can only blame himself. He was offered the Pramac ride. He was the one who turned it down. 
for whatever his reasons. And you, I think, were on the money saying he likes that family environment. Mm -hmm. But is that family environment now kicking him in the nuts? I don't know. You know, so what's going on there? As you say, third in the championship last year. Um, you've got to turn to page two of the championship results to actually see where he is. So disappointing, to say the least. I like I like how you how you pull that apart. Very very well done, Paul. I like that. Um, Brad was obviously in nine fourteen seconds off. You know, I also dissected that. It's a long lap at at Cota. It's it's a long race with everything that happened with Brad. You know, turn one, losing a lot of time, his injury, not having the bike set up, riding panic, getting things whatever. Fourteen seconds off, not terrible. We've kind of finished with with a bad discussion. Ralph Fernandez in 10th place, 16 seconds off, ahead of Miguel Oliveira in 11th. Now, I know we've had a couple of uh, comments here already about, you know, bringing Miguel Oliveira and, and that conversation. It was a home race for, for Trackhouse Racing. I like what Trackhouse are doing off track. I like how they're bringing the NASCAR. In. I like the vibe Trackhouse are bringing. I must be honest, the merchandise looks good. Uh, I love the livery of them. I love, I love what Trackhouse as a team are doing. On track, they're not getting the results that they need to all the having said that they're doing better than than what they did last year so raul you know i still see him as a 10th at best kind of rider at the moment in moto gp we, we we've spoken about him before but certainly miguel's looking at that and he should not be beaten by raul's on last year's spec aprilia the less experienced of the teammate you know if miguel's got a problem here miguel to me, has got a big, big, big problem here. Rob, you know, we discuss it every weekend. What are we going to do with Oliveira? I honestly think that he's going to be joining Walk and Seymour, as we've discussed in the past. There's limited amounts of rides, but at the moment, there's limited amounts of riders to step into the, the mm -hmm. shoes to fill. So, Oliveira, that's the one thing that I, can, I think counts in his favor. However, we saw Joe Roberts get a second place in Moto2. He's the American. It's an American team. They're already speaking about wanting an American. I don't know if you heard the interviews with Kenny Roberts Sr. He was like, why are there no Americans in the race? I'm looking for the Americans. You know, that's what he said on the grid, and rightfully so. When last did we have an American in the MotoGP paddock? You know, I think Ben Spees might have been the last. I can't even remember. So... Miguel Oliveira is going to be directly under threat if Fernandez keeps beating him and Joe Roberts keeps getting reasonably good results in Moto2. They'll move him, there's no doubt. Um, so, yeah, difficult one. Me personally, I'm, I'm not at all surprised to see Raul beating Miguel. I believe he's a better rider. He, he's had two shocking seasons by MotoGP standards. But now this year he had... He, had, he missed the first test because he had had the big crash on, on lap two or three. But since then, he's been good, Rob. He's been consistently hitting on the top 10, which he hadn't done in the past. So I'm not surprised at all. And I personally think he's maturing. He's matured as a rider. He's matured as a team rider to know that he's got to beat his teammate first and foremost. And this is an important year. So I won't be surprised at all if he beats uh, Oliveira in the championship and almost every weekend. So I'm actually, I'm me. I think it's, he's starting to show what he showed in that Moto Two year where he raced uh, Remy Gardner to the line. Um, he certainly has the ability. He just hasn't put it together. I think he's settling down. So uh, me, I'm quite impressed with him. Well, Paul, thank you for getting rid of all of our Portuguese fans. I appreciate that. I was trying to <laughs> yes, sorry to all the Portuguese fans. That's oh, talking with my head. <laughs> I was trying to let things out easily. Um, no, but you're 100% you're right. Oli Moto's got it right as well. I, I think he's summed it up perfectly. Uh, Ralph Fernandez just hasn't got going um, and in many ways will um, or, or might. And Oliveira is an enigma. He won races, but is nowhere otherwise. And 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 that's Oliveira's problem is he, uh, he's kind of still in the paddock and still relying on what he's done in the past and he's not producing anything now. So it is it is worrying um, for, for Portuguese fans. There's, there's no way to hide. Yes, um, the other comment here, Peter Garmany, no excuse, but Miguel Oliveira was quite badly hindered um, with, a, with a Morbidelli crash. But it's time for, for, for Oliveira to start performing because as Olimoto says, the, the Roberts deal to MotoGP is done. For me, it's, also, it, it's done. Whether it's going to be Oliveira or Fernandez's head. I think it will be Fernandez's head over Oliveira because Oliveira has good financial support. He's Portuguese blue-eyed boy. Losing another Spaniard 
is okay compared to losing the only Portuguese rider in the field. So um, Gerloff was the latest American on a MotoGP bike. Um, you know, he was he yeah. was there this weekend. And, but did he only do wild card rides, or was he yeah, yeah, no, no, he did. Yeah, he climbed on he climbed on the Yamaha and you know on yeah. the Petronas bike. Yeah, I'm talking full time riders. Yeah, 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 yeah. So look, there, there, there's that argument there as well that um, we know what's on the cards there. Whether that team's going to go full American with two American riders and make that big statement, I don't think so. I think Joe Roberts makes sense. He's in the MotoGP paddock. He's performing now. Um, whether it's going to be Raul or or Miguel, let's wait and see. The, the problem is if 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 it is Raul that's gone, where does he go? Um, is there a spot for him? Does he go back to Moto2? Does he go World Superbikes? Those are the kind of conversations I think that are going to become clearer as the season goes on. With those or two does riders. Augusto Fernandez move out and he takes over at KTM or will or gas gas? But will they have him back because he walked out? Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I think that I, I think that relationship between Raul and 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 the PM Mobility Group is over. I don't think that's even no, an option. Yeah. Um, the, the Augusto Fernandez will get a get upon just now. Fabio Quattararo in twelfth. We know, you know, again he he was knocked off or ran wide something in the race and kind of fought his way back. Um, the interesting thing with Fabio is making that decision now as well. Yeah, I know we all think it was just money based, and I still do think it, it was the right move. Take the money and and hope. But having said that, slowly these these pieces of the puzzle are starting to come together. You know that maybe shifted his mindset to sign with Yamaha. Lynn Jarvis is now going. He's gone. End what have season. I been saying for the last yeah, six months? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and as soon as I heard it, I immediately thought of Paul and went, "Geez." You know, Paul's Paul's sent a press release to someone or said something to someone <laughs> because now this is coming. But you know, starting to think about these factors of of Fabio, right? New management. Maybe he knows who that new management is, or is it a brevio? I don't know. I don't know. But there's something Fabio knows that maybe helped him make this decision. So he's gone, and there's talk of either Premac or someone. There's going to be a satellite Yamaha team for next year: Cresini, Premac, or VR46. So all these kind of factors now start making the Yamaha picture a little bit better for Fabio, plus the fact that you're getting the most money out of any rider. So Fabio's season this year, I think, is going to be, I don't think there's going to be setting the world on fire. I think it's just they're going to go through the season and hope the package gets better. I mean, Alex Renz won on a terrible Honda at the same track last year. This year, he was nowhere. Uh, he, 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 he was absolutely nowhere. So the Yamaha conversation is a tricky one. It's about trying to get better, but there's these big statements. Lynn Jarvis, gone. We've signed Fabio again for another two years. Great, paying him big money. So there's a lot of positives, but the negatives are still that they're not competing on the track. Uh, and however you say it in a press release or however you like to sugarcoat it, the fact is they're not performing on track. Yeah, and, and you can't sugarcoat it. Obviously, we've mentioned it in the past, and they signed or, or poached two top technicians from Ducati, and they poached, if that's the right word, the engine builder from Ferrari. So definitely, he obviously was party to all those improvements. I've been saying it for a while. I think Lynn Jarvis should move on. That's happening. Who's going to fill that spot is going to be a very interesting one. They are talking um, Massimo Marigali, but I think that would be an interim position. Me personally, I don't see it happening, but I'd love to see Brivio going back there. But going back to Davide Brivio, that's why track house racing are going up a notch, up a notch. I believe the whole package is team management, and he maybe has now seen something, in, and we're going back a little bit to Raul Fernandez, and he's saying, I've seen something, and I can manage this guy. Remember, he managed Rins and um, Maverick at Suzuki. So I think that's a big thing. Whether he's going to go to Yamaha, going back to that discussion, time will tell. I don't know what contract he signed with Trackhouse. I'd like to see him stay at Trackhouse and build something there. We need additional teams to come to the fore. Yamaha, obviously, I don't believe, and, and I, was, I, I was shocked when Fabio resigned. I thought the deal with Aprilia was done and he was going to tell us and it would be finished. So... He obviously is part and parcel to big things that are happening. So I, I think this year, not too much will change. They've obviously got all the concessions. They can do a lot more testing. So I can't see big changes this year. Yeah. Um, but I think next year we're going to see a different bike. I think it's going to be quite a shift. And he obviously knows that. And yeah, 
Um, not a great weekend for him. You know, as you say, he got punted and then he came from, I think he overtook three or four. But he's hanging around in 10th to 14th place, not where he should be. Um, but I don't think the bike's much more capable than, than that. But saying that, did you see the top speeds of the Yamaha? Yeah. It certainly was on par with everyone else. So whether that's the slipstream effect, I'm, I'm not too sure. But they were all hovering in the, I remember it was 213, 214, 215 miles an hour. I think it was 335 k's an hour. So yeah, certainly the bike is getting better. He's obviously got a lot of faith in them because you and I discussed it. Also, his demeanor's changed. Remember last year, you kept saying it. This looks... He's riding, but he's not here. Yeah. His demeanor has changed. You can see it. He looks more at ease. So maybe, you know, when you arrive, I don't know if you saw that thing, he arrived at the track with a mm -hmm. five and a half million rand watch on his arm. Mm -hmm. You know, when the bank balance is topped up by that amount, or you know it's going to happen, it takes a bit of pressure off you. So, But I, I'm, I don't for one second say it's because he's got money now that he's happier. Yeah. I think he's he's content in what's happening. So, And a content rider, we've seen it. He'll... He'll be good. He, yeah. I mean, he is good. The bike at the moment is not up to his standard. Uh, Mariska Hutchinson, is Rob's cap blurred or is it my almost 42-year-old eyes? So my cap's not blurred. It's zero motorcycles. So for those of you who don't know, obviously, sadly, uh, I don't make money out of Motor Rider World enough to pay myself in the UK. So my brother runs Motor Rider World now and, um, you know, that's how he makes his money. And I work for zero motorcycles here in the UK as their marketing man so yeah electric bike rules petrol bikes drool um, <laughs> so flying the flag but yeah proudly presenting the company that i work for so it is brilliant listen uh, i love petrol bikes and i'm i'm a super bike nut at heart but this electric motorcycle especially zero i wouldn't be working for something i didn't believe in or didn't think was a good product so just had to throw that in there paul one note that you made there quickly about and, and it's something i noticed on on the um on the weekend as well. This Ducati having a clear advantage in, in the speed, that's gone. The Honda yeah. was fast, Pedro Costa and the KTMs were fast. Uh, the Yamaha was fast. So top speed, they've all kind of kind of sorted themselves out. There's no more big advantage for Ducati there. One thing I did notice that Rins came out saying was how sluggish the Yamaha was, you know, to turn. It was, it's lost that, well, he doesn't know, but Yamaha was always renowned for this flexible chassis. It was able to, you know, the agile chassis. So they found speed and they've lost that. And we always said that was going to be the big thing for Yamaha was to keep that agility, but find the speed. But there's all, for every action, there's a reaction. And they seem to have lost that. And that was a big thing that came out of it. Yes, all the Honda included, they found speed and KTM to match the Ducati. It's now about finding the aero and, and, and the agility and the everything else to go with that yeah and, and that's where you know where do you draw the line so now they've got the speed they've lost the agility is the big thing happening with yamaha that they're going to throw away the inline four you know what's going to happen there um it's quite a difficult situation to manage for them they need to progress they've yeah. certainly got the speed um i'm not quite sure what the what the way forward for them is um, if you have a look at the handling of all the bikes, if you put them in a line and said, okay, which one do we think handles best? Well, what are you talking about? Fast corners were always for the Yamahas or chain, fast change of directions. So Kota, not turn one, but then what was it? Two, three, four, left, right, left. I can remember initially when Zarko was on that uh, monster Yamaha, how good he was through there. Now you're not seeing that with the Yamaha. So have they traded aero and hand and top speed for agility you know rob i don't know i, I think aero's got a lot to do with it um you know they're looking at aero for stability on on braking and stability on acceleration is that now taken away from that ability because they've got wings on the bikes wings are designed to work in a straight line mm -hmm. and the more you start angling the bike you you're changing the natural gyroscopic movement of the bike so i don't know it's a Difficult one, but certainly going back to your initial question or remark, your top speeds are, you know, they're balanced now. They're almost all in the same playing field. Okay, um, Paul, let's move on now to a very sensitive subject. You know, we can talk about Marini and the Hondas and that, but it's there for everyone to see. Uh, yeah. it's, it's horrible. Let's talk about, uh, you know, a more closer to heart subject that everyone's asking for, and I think it's the, the best way to end off the show. Um, Darren Binder. 
Now it, it is. It's a it's a hard topic to talk about for me, especially at the moment as well, because you know you you and I will always support Darren. There's a lot of people that will always support Darren out there. Uh, again, stats, performances. These are what you know identify a rider. These are what you know propel a rider. These are what keep a rider there. These are these are what make a rider. Results, performances. That they're not there for Darren at the moment. They, and, and 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 it would be silly for me to come on here and say, ah, oh, no, I can't. It's hard to fight it. That the performances are just not there now. Whether it's the team, whether it's Darren, I don't know. But something has to change. Something has to change. It's it's not it's not there. And and this is not me being negative. This is me being real. This is me as a Darren Binder fan and a pundit and as a journalist and whatever you want to. This is the real situation we find ourselves in. Wayne Taylor, if we talk head and not heart, Darren won't be on the grid next year. He hasn't shown anything in Moto2 to warrant a good ride. If we speak heart, he will come good. That sums it up perfectly. I am petrified that Darren won't get the results to keep him in that championship next year. Um, and, and why that scares me is because I've spoken to Darren and his dad and everyone else. And World Superbikes, in a way, is not an option because it's a failure. So World Supersport and that, maybe it will become an option if this doesn't work out. I don't know. But they don't want to even entertain that. Their main focus is making this work. And we know that from Darren. Um, so, yeah, as a fan, don't worry. He'll come good. It's coming. The reality is it's not. It's, it's not working. So... So, so what? what? What do we do? What needs to change? Why is this not working? Yeah, that's such a, you know, that's a question that if we could, if he could answer that, he'd know exactly what he needed to do. 100%, he's giving 100%. That's all he'll ever do, or 110%. Whether it's the bike that's not capable, but it's a Calex chassis. They, you know, besides maybe the top two or three, which I think were Bosco Scuros, the rest are Calex. He, and, and, I try and watch all of Friday, all of Saturday. If I don't see it live, I'll record it and watch it at some point. We don't get to see Darren on TV. So the only thing we ever see is because he's lagging in 18th to 25th place. All we ever see is his name on the timing sheets. And all I'm hoping is he'll make it into the top 40, make it into, you know, and he just never seems to, you know, he'll put in one good lap at the beginning of the session, but that's when no one else has gone out yet. So I, I, I honestly don't know um, whoever posted the comments. It was it Steve who said that, you know, talking with your head, yeah, we have to agree. Talking with your heart, he'll be world champion this year. Yeah. Um, yeah. He needs to, you know, he didn't have great results last year. I think his best being a seventh. To finish seventh shows he has the ability, but he can't yeah. have the ability, you know, once every or twice a year, you know. So very difficult one. He's certainly um, going to have a very difficult rest of the season if he wants to retain his ride i think he'll run out of choices he's not in a top tier team which is quite surprising because if you look at their moto 3 team it's fantastic you know mm -hmm. and you would i don't know what the time is how much the links are between the two teams but i mean between him and his teammate they're languishing you know bottom third of the grid um very difficult one I'd, I'd love to say we know this is the problem and it's going to get better but we discuss this every week and unfortunately it's kind of the same has darren reached his ceiling is that his ceiling i don't know personal opinion i don't think he has the same amount of talent as brad that's just i think that's a given but i think he's got enough talent to be top top 15 top top 10 he's done it why can't he do it consistently same in moto three he would never mind the dive bomb Darren Monica that he got, which I think was a little bit unfair at times, but he would blow hot and cold. One weekend he'd be, yes, top five, fantastic. And then the next weekend he'd struggle to make the top 10. So a little bit of inconsistency there. I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I wish there was an easy solution to it. I think it's, it's just, he might just be in a field that is so stacked at the moment. And remember, we've got no rider aids. It's purely you know, you and your machine, and is he being exposed? I, I, you know, I hate to say it, but that's talking with the head and yeah, we support yeah. him 100%, but yeah. you also going to sometimes be, be a realist, you know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people commenting down the side, yeah, um, you know, as a team up to scratch, the team made the move from Olin's to WP suspension. Jake yeah. Dixon also, team also made that move, and, 
you know, he's battling a bit. Olimoto says, you know, he's still struggling with injury as well, Dixon. And so there's a couple of factors as a fan you take in and go, it's not Darren's fault. It's the team. They're not performing. And the team have, again, as you said, we don't see the full picture with what's shown on TV. But with the information that we're fed and that you look at the timing and with qualifying, he's always out late. He's never out when he should be. You know, there's these technical gremlins that he's dealt with. Uh, it's... It is a hard one. It is a hard one. I will support Darren to to the end of the earth. It's our support for Darren will never change. You know, we we've we we've, we've got to support him, especially times like this where he, he he's going to need that support, and we're going to have to show that support. But there's the being a realist side of going. You know, there's there's this there's this sad reality that if something doesn't change, this this kid could be back in South Africa. You know, and and not racing a motorcycle, or if he doesn't want to go the World Super Sport route, which is a possibility, and could rekindle his career there. Look at Bulliga, you know, went as nothing in Moto Two into World Super Sport, and now he's winning World Superbike races. You know, that that's a reality that Darren and them, if they want to continue racing, that you know they have to look at. Um, you know, also just on that point, look at Stephen Urdendahl spent I think two years in Moto Two, then he went to Super Sport and he finished runner up in the championship. You know. So Darren mustn't be, and I'm not suggesting for a second he should, I think he must keep his options open elsewhere. And as you say, Bullig is a great example. But so is Stephen Udendahl. I think they must just not be too 100% focused. If we don't get a Moto GP, Moto 2 ride, we're not going anywhere. There could be good options available to him elsewhere because certainly, you know, remember the, the race in the wet last, the year before last when he was on the Moto GP bike and he passed Brad. I think he finished fifth or sixth. It was raining. Rain is a leveler in any motorsport. And that just showed, I don't know if you can remember that race, how good he is. You know, because in the wet conditions where you take away all the, the advantage of the bike, you go back to the rider. Darren was, I think he finished fifth or sixth. It was on the MotoGP bike. He was exquisite. So it shows the talent is there. But he's in a field where... They've all got the same amount of talent and the rider aids are not there. So now it boils down to, you know, you as the rider more so than maybe in MotoGP. Um, so you're a difficult one for him, but you're, your example of Bulliga and, and as I say, Stephen Rudendahl, are, you know, there, there, there could be lots of doors open for him. I don't know if staying in Moto2 is the right thing for him because I can't see him getting a top ride on that MST bike or um, if Elder Gale moves on, which we know he's doing on that. You know, so I can't see it happening, but... You know, you never know. Maybe they've got someone working behind the scenes who can pull some strings there. Yeah, you know, Sven Grinner makes a good point. Yeah, I find we're criticizing the riders too much when the team behind them make a huge part of results. How's that uh, that saying go? Winning together and losing together. And, but this is this is the this is the tricky thing with Moto Two at the moment. You can't put your your finger on it. Mark VDS were the strongest team in Moto Two yeah. finals. Now Selech and you know, Abelino is just nowhere. Yeah. You know, nowhere. and then there's Ital Trance that lost their way for a while. And now Dennis Foggia, who I forgot even existed, is on the podium at Cota. Yeah, there's the IO team that dominated Vietti's nowhere. Yeah. So this Moto 2 is just you know, Boscus Curo has become probably the the shine out and the most standout. Aldeguer, uh, Lopez, you know, those kind of riders are, are standing out. Canet, you know, won his race and was there but wasn't there this weekend. So Moto Two is just this mixed bag of you, you actually don't know what there's Garcia, you know, winning winning the race. I've always kind of held Garcia with high regard. Didn't see him winning at Cota, to be honest, but there he won at Cota. So Moto Two is just like it's like this Bermuda Triangle in in a way. It 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 exists in the fact that it's easy to get lost in, but then it doesn't exist because you know, it's Moto2 and, and there's riders performing and going into to MotoGP and, and, and doing well. So I do think it's, I, I do think the team need to sort themselves out because, you know, Senna, Aegis, or however you say his surname, what well, the team haven't performed in a long time, put it that yeah. way. The team yeah. haven't shown in a long time, which, which that's why you could point it in and say, but, <laughs> and it kills me to say this, but at the same time, you know, there's been, performances from riders that have ridden above the team and the bike's capability to get results and Darren's just not able to do that um which which kills me to say 
but it, yeah. but it is the reality, and that's what's always going to be in in Darren's. You know, that people are always going to be able to point the finger at Darren and have that on him. So until he can just put in one or two or three really good rides, just riding over the, the bike's capability in that. And I know Stephen Berry, he broke it down. Yeah, but Darren was only 0.9 off in that. Yeah, if you delve deeper, we know those those facts. We know those inner workings. And that's what we hold on to, that Darren is still capable of doing this and winning. But the Sunday sheet that comes out, you know, after every Sunday, and there's a Darren Binder crash or, or not in the top 15 or qualifying last or whatever those are the the sheets and the facts that that count and at the moment those are what it, those are what's killing him and and killing his career and it must be killing his confidence and i know someone put on there you know johnny martins how do we get how do we as a group show support he isn't very active on social media and i, I do i hate the fact that they're not that active and they don't show us more that they're not those kind of personalities you know they're not a martin and a alicia spargo that show more of their, their their everyday life brad and darren want to go race motorcycles and fast that's that's what they want to do but johnny i think the only way we can do it is just put a picture of darren up on your social and just say darren we love you we support you no matter what you know the more the more people that do that the more we can paint the social world with darren binder support the better you know and the the hard thing for me with darren is it's just the, the last five years has just seemed like this big struggle for Darren, you know, and, he, and he's fought it. And I, this is where I give him credit. He's, he still smiles. He still shows this willingness to be there. But, you know, he went through the Foggia thing. He went through the MotoGP stuff. He went through not having a ride and then, you know, getting this Moto2 ride. He went through so much and, there just needs to be a light at the end of the tunnel for Darren. You know, that's that's a, that, that's what I want to see. I just hope more than anything it can come. But at the moment, you just I can't see where it's going to come from, and and that's the frustrating part. Yeah, and Sven's question, you know, it's about the team. You know, this team collectively hasn't performed. So what is the problem? Is it a budgetary problem? Do they not have the resources? Do they not have the technical skills? things that we can't answer so i'm going to go back to your point you mentioned too. i think it was johnny let's show darren our support that's all we can do besides showing him our support and you know he's a great guy and we want him to do well we can't do anything more than that but i think collectively the team seems to be not one of the teams that are that look like they have the ability to be racing at the front and that can also hold the rider back so mm -hmm. that's a very difficult one where as you mentioned the Mark VDSs, the Aki's teams, they've always had riders consistently at the front. Um, and the guard might change year on year. But this team, for the two years that, when I say we've been involved with Darren being with them, as a collective, the team is consistent. When he's got a seventh, it's blown them away. Other than that, they seem to be a 15 to 20 kind of team, collectively, both riders. So, you know, what, the, what goes on behind the scenes could be, part of the problem within the team yeah you know you're throwing the jake dixon incident last year that happened i think one big factor is still you know the no breaks at sepang you know i've, I've, yeah. I've had that feeling you know and i still battle with that trusting a motorcycle you know with the brakes you know that's got to be impacting darren how much does he trust his team you know the team not letting him out at the right times you know how much faith is there so i think collectively the team need to improve for darren Darren, in some ways, needs to improve for the team. And they need to get themselves, they need to just, right, they start on a clean slate. We've got to provide Darren with better resources, a more trustworthy environment, a more trustworthy setup and team and whatever. Darren, you've got to pick up those performances. It, it, there needs to be this, right, guys, let's 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 do this together. Because at the moment, it's not working. It, it's, it's there for everyone to see it's not working. But it needs to change. Because, as I said, the last thing I want to see, and I think any fan of Darren wants to see is just fading away into the sunset and, and that's where the Darren Binder story ends. I think there's more to it. I think Darren has so much more to offer. Um, as 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 um, Stephen Berry said, it's a confidence thing. You know, Darren's had to deal with all these things. If you look at the the, the Pedro kind of graduation from Moto3 to MotoGP, it's been a lot more streamlined. Yes, and it's because of talent. Listen, Pedro Costa is a better rider than Darren Binder. He's proven that. That's done. 
you know, but Darren has had a lot more to deal with in his career that and you can say as much as you want that Darren's hard and it hasn't affected him. It has to. Those kind of things have to affect you. You're, you're a human being at the end of the day. We look how, you know, these kind of things affected Mark Marquez. We look how these things affected Valentino Rossi. They need to kind of come to the agreement of, right, clean slate. We've got to start again and, and, and make this work because otherwise we might as well just call it quits in many ways. So whatever problems Darren's got with the team, if there are any, and the team's got with Darren, right, fix it, fix it or lose it, fix it or lose it. But um, yeah. the, only, the, only, the only thing that I could end off with the whole argument for Brad and Darren is, you know, we support you. We love you. I certainly love both boys personally and in their racing careers. And let's just go out there and make it happen. And and showing our support is what we can do. Yes, we can pull it apart and be honest and and bring and call it. You know, answer the Andre, uh, the, the 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 Andrew Adams and all these guys that are calling out Brad and their failings in that, which are 100% justified for facts. Boom. At the end of the day, we support. We love them. We are behind them no matter what. And let's go make it work. And also, you know, one hundred percent, we support them. And you know, if you think about it, how few countries in the world who race motorcycles have riders in two categories from the same little country? So we're very blessed that we've got Brad in MotoGP, Darren in Moto Two that we can shout for. Yes, they sometimes let us down, and yes, we want them to win every single race. Not going to happen, but at least we've got a vested interest. Yes, we love MotoGP racing, so we're going to watch it, and we've got our guys that we enjoy watching and guys we don't like. But having a South African vested interest just moves the level up. Man, another 10 notches. So to me, that's the highlight. That Like on the weekend, they must have shown, I think besides the American flag, the next most popular flag was the South African flag. Mm. Come on, guys, we're from a hick little country at the bottom of Africa that nobody even knows exists. Uh -huh. And this is the awareness that the Binder brothers have created. Mm. So love them or hate them, Admit that they're the best or admit that they're not the best, irrelevant. They are boykies and we support them 100% to the best of their abilities. And, you know, besides, the, you know, it's not life and death whether they win or lose. We're just there to support them. And I think that's that's the most important thing, how we want them to do well. And I do believe Brad is world championship material. But, yeah, you know, that's all we can do. We can only support them. We can't change anything. We can't give them advice. Um, we can give them our opinions and our love, and that's it. Love it, Paul. Love it. Uh, Carlo Williams, Rob, I'm going to Catalonia and wanted to buy BB T-shirts. They're not the best in SA, and they're not easy to get hold of either in the UK. I've always been a Rossi fan, and it was so easy to get official merchandise. We as fans want to show our support when we're there. Both brothers could do so much better on the merchandise side of things. You know, this is, to be honest, Carlo, this is a question I get asked all the time. I know there is the Binder Brothers Racing, you know, apparel that you can buy in South Africa, the shirts and caps and stuff. Um, I do get, you know, asked about it a lot every day. You know, the, the, the pricing's not right, the quality's not there, um, the designs haven't been updated, and, 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 and. Um, I know there's the Ixon stuff that's available at the racetrack. So at the Catalonia GP, you go to the Ixon truck, you'll see there'll be Brad Binder stuff there. I actually asked this question to, to, to Brad's manager the other day. I sent him an email saying, listen, I'm getting a lot a lot of people asking about the apparel made available in the UK because even the stuff from South Africa, they don't ship outside of South Africa and the Exxon stuff is more European based. So the UK, it's very hard to, to get in what well, any kind of Brad Binder specific stuff. You can get the KTM Brad stuff, but to get Brad and Darren stuff is not very easy. So I asked the question about potentially doing something myself uh, as a sideline business here in the UK of getting stuff made up, obviously with, within Brad and, you know, I've done it before back in South Africa, I started Brad Binder uh, and Darren's clothing line. Um, so looking at doing something like that and his manager came to me with uh, a comment of he's working on something really big, something really big is in the pipeline. If it doesn't come through, we can maybe relook at this doing UK specific kind of merch to help satisfy this craving of, because there is, there's a big Brad Binder fan base, South African and UK and European base that want more. So, um, so let's see. That that's a, a subject that that I'm sure there'll be plenty more talk around. But at the moment, your best option if you're going to Catalonia, just go to the Exxon truck. Tell them your friends with with Rob. 
Portman, you'll even get a 10% discount, which is really cool in the XM truck. Um, so yeah, let's 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 see how that goes. Uh, Oli Moto, any luck with the pass for Brands Hat yet, Rob? Oli, I'm I want to go to Brands Hatch and watch as a fan, but I do need to go to Brands Hatch and would love to get Rossi to sign some stuff. Uh, I, I'm still working on it. I didn't get the media pass that I wanted, obviously, because we're not a, a motorcycle, a, a car related um, media company. So I didn't get that. So I'm trying to work on some connections to see if I can just get into the paddock and be there. So hopefully I will see you there. If not, I know someone posted as well about doing a, a SA supporters group at Silverstone because there'll be a big fan base there, which I fully agree with. So let's stay in contact and stay in touch about that because myself, James Dent, and uh, one of the Binder Brothers' closest friends is coming with us as well. So we'll definitely be there. So yeah, let's let's meet up together and and have a, a good big chat. You know, we're there the whole weekend. There's a lot of time to just get together, mingle, talk. Uh, so yeah, let's definitely stay in contact and try and make a meet up there. So um, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Some great comments as always. You know, it's 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 good that the, the conversation goes up there and everyone gets their point and we get a bit heated and we're able to bring it down. And that that, that, that that's what it's about. We, you know, we we as Paul has said multiple times, it's about this and this, and it's trying to find that balance. So Stephen Berry, um, thank you so much for all your comments. Wade Williams, thanks, Robin Paul. Awesome shows always. Really can't thank you all enough for the support. As I said, it's you know, I wish I was making millions or at least a living out of this. This is very much just again with Paul. This is taking our time out to talk about the greatest sport in the world and bring you all into it. So, Paulie, thank you so much again. Uh, we'll catch up with you in a couple of weeks' time. Um Always good chatting with you, Paul. Love, love your your insights. Even though we have no more Australian fans tuning into us, no more Portuguese fans tuning in. But it's always great having you. Listen, it's going to be a problem trying to get a, get rid of all those Spanish fans. <laughs> that list is long. <laughs> yeah, Rob, absolutely fantastic. Um, really nice to have a chat. Fantastic racing once again. Surprise winner, as we all know. And yeah, I look forward to Jerez. It's always a great race. It's going to throw some definite. Um, spanners in the works with lots of the Spanish riders being competitive there. So, yeah, let's see how it goes. And to everyone who tuned in, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Olimoto, we've met a few times. But I, who's Olimoto? Message me on Messenger. And send me a picture of you. I'm terrible with names and I'm terrible with faces. So, Olimoto, that's... And I see your caricature there. So, yeah, let's let, let's chat some more. Uh, Lisa Esman, great to have you uh, tuned into the show. And what a great job your, your son Bjorn Esman's doing there, uh, right behind Brad and, and, and doing everything there for Brad. So, brilliant. Absolutely love it. And, and again, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great week further. And until um, Tuesday after Jerez, um, stay well, keep well, and uh, enjoy life. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.